We are so excited to have her. She received her training at the University of Kentucky in neurology and is now a fellow in the geriatric neurology program under the mentorship of Dr. Draco. We're grateful to have her here today. Thank you, Dr. Wojcicki. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to see all your bright, shiny faces. It looks like everyone had their coffee. <laughs> I need more. <laughs> Well, like she mentioned, I'm Dr. Bojarski. All my patients in clinic call me Dr. Bojo. So if y'all feel free to call me Dr. Bojo, um, I'm very Polish. I make my own progies and everything once a year, but just introduce me. Like she said, I'm the geriatric fellow. So that means that I have done my medical school. I've done all of my residency training. I am a neurologist, pending board certification next month. Um, and then I'm doing an extra year of training in dementia specialty specifically. So I've had some exposure in residency, but now I'm getting into the real down nitty gritty of dementia care. And so I'm really happy to be able to talk about that with you guys today. It's my passion. I love talking about it so much. Hence why I'm trading in it for another year, right? So is there a way that I can like minimize this? Okay, perfect. I think every time I press the keyboard, that might pop up. So we'll check. So when we talk about the brain, we talk about how it's organized. There's different aspects in different parts of the brain that do separate but different functions. So over here, we have our frontal lobe. So when you're looking at this brain, it's like it's like if my brain like this was superimposed right here. So frontal lobe is gonna be up here. This is in charge of your problem solving, call it executive function. So your personality, how creatively you think. You know, artists have great frontal lobes. And so we, we problem solve through our frontal lobe and that feeds into the rest of our brain to decide, you know, what do we wanna do? How do we wanna do it? We get to be individuals through our frontal lobe, basically. When we have our parental lobe, that's a little bit farther back. That's how we see the um, space integration of the world. So it's how we integrate reading and understanding language. It's how you know I can tell that you're over here and you're over here. It's not the vision part, but it's how I'm interpreting space and time, okay? Then in the occipital lobe, we got our eagle eyes back here. That's where our vision is. So we see with our eyes, but they go all the way to the back. The nerves go all the way the back to the brain. And that's where you're able to interpret vision. So that's how I can see all of you guys, right? And then we have the temporal lobe, which is our particular favorite place to focus on because that's where we tend to see more of the Alzheimer's pathology. But we usually focus on temporal lobe. That's where our memories are formed. There's a circuit in there that then reaches out to separate parts of the brain but where it's stored is everywhere, but our memories are formed in that temporal lobe, which is why when we talk about short-term memory and things, we're always wondering, well, what does the temporal lobe look like? That's why we're always wanting to see MRIs or pictures of the brain. Has it atrophy? The brain's a muscle, right? It can disintegrate over time. Is there atrophy in that temporal lobe that we could look for that might clue us into the pathology? And then the last two parts are our brainstem. Evolutionarily, we grew this way. So this is all of our basic life functions. This is how we stay awake. This is how we are knowing to sleep. This is how we breathe. So our most, most basic functions come from the brainstem. And then our cerebellum is how I'm standing on my high heels today and not able to fall down. It's helpful with my balance. It's helpful with my coordination and my motor learning and how to integrate into space and time with maintaining upright mobility. So when we talk about dementia, we say it's an umbrella term. And when we say umbrella term, it means dementia is an overarching topic, but there's multiple different things that can be addressed underneath that umbrella term. So dementia itself is the illness of the brain resulting in impairments in multiple spheres of cognition, right? So different parts of that brain that we just talked about, that's what we consider as dementia. There's different parts of the brain that's not quite working the way we wanted it to. It doesn't imply diagnosis or etiology. That's why you come here. That's why you talk to us. We figure out, okay, if they do have dementia, what's causing that dementia, right? Dementia is more how we're functioning. And then our job is to find out why and how do we help you guys moving forward or how we help our, our patients moving forward. So dementia, like we said, is an umbrella term. It's a collection of symptoms caused by disorders of the brain. We all know the Alzheimer's is the most common. But we also have other things such as Lewy body dementia. We have mixed dementia, which can be a combination of, you know, both of 
or two or more of all these things from temporal dementia, vascular disease, which is fairly frequent. And I, I don't know if y'all have heard of late, but it's a big associated um, encephalopathy. And it can look very much like Alzheimer's but develops late in life. So is it a combo of these things? Is it just one of these things? That's what we try to find out. And like we said, when we say all the causes of dementia, we only mention really the most common ones. When we're seeing a patient, we are keeping all of these other things in mind that could potentially cause dementia, things like depression, things like normal pressure hydrocephalus, things like um, thyroid problems, vitamin deficiency. Those are all things that we're checking when we see a patient. We're keeping all of these things in mind. And based off of your history that you're giving for the patient or the patient themselves, we're able to kind of pick and choose like, okay, what do we think is the most common thing? And we're going to test for that. So this is a very busy slide and there's no test at the end, so you don't have to memorize this, don't worry. But this is just going into detail about some of the more common things. So for example, Alzheimer's disease, which we talk about a fair amount, we talk about how there's abnormal deposits of proteins that form amyloid plaques. I don't know if you guys have heard that term, but amyloid plaques is something that we try and attack with medicine so that they don't form um, uh, tau tangles, which is kind of like that end stage of disease is, is how we seem to look at it. So mild symptoms of that are wandering, getting lost, especially in, you know, your neighborhood that you kind of grew up forever in. You should know that area. Sometimes if you get Alzheimer's, you'll wander and you'll get lost in that area that you should know very well. And then that can sometimes, you know, progress to problems recognizing friends and family and impulsive behavior. And then ultimately it can become so severe that you can't communicate. That is the severe, you know, end point, <laughs> but to give you guys an understanding of how that could present. Um, ultimately, in general, the... Do we need to admit these? I'm doing it. Work. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Um, so anyway, yeah, and then there's some other dementias as well that I'm not going to go into, but just ultimately our research shows that for the most part, it can be mixed, right? People can have however many problems that they decide to have, right? We don't, it's not a one size fits all for a diagnosis. And we're aiming to work with you and our patients in order to figure out what the most likely diagnosis is so we can treat in the best way because that changes our management. So like we mentioned earlier, we're going to go into Alzheimer's disease a little bit more. And it's ultimately a progressive neurodegenerative illness leading to increasing impairments in multiple spheres of cognition, including memory. So remember that temporal lobe we were talking about earlier, that's really going to be the main component of the memory problems is when we start to see that. And this is a gross specimen of a brain. I'm sorry, I know it's early, so it might be a little unsettling, but this is a gross anatomy um, of a brain of an Alzheimer's patient. You can tell that there are a little bit more spaces right here. We call this the insula. There should not be that much space within a brain. So that tells me, okay, there might be some temporal lobe atrophy because temporal lobes are right here. And can you tell that they're, you know, but they're a lot less boompy. There's less volume than over here in some of these other areas. But these areas are also affected. I see, you know, deep sulci, which are these little grooves in the brain. And that tells me that there might be muscle loss. Like we said, the brain is a, is a muscle. It can lose muscle mass over time. And then within here can be our hippocampi, which you guys might've heard is also key in memory formation. So when we look at MRIs, it's basically like we're looking at this, but on an MRI. And so we can see if the hippocampi look a little bit less. Again, that's going to clue us in maybe to an Alzheimer's picture. And then these are what we see under microscope slides. We see the neuritic plaques and neurofibrillary tangles. Those are both indicative of an Alzheimer's pathology. So we can see it under the microscope. We can see it there. And that's how we're able to figure out you know, what kind of diagnosis people have. We mentioned hippocampal size progression. This is basically just showing you on, this looks like a PET scan, but on neuroimaging, a normal patient will have some degradation of hippocampal volume over time. So you can see here, a 25-year-old patient, the hippocampi look pretty, pretty decent, pretty fluffy, but then they get a little, a little smaller over time, but not prominently, right? So you can still have small atrophy over time, 
that's normal aging. But if we find that it's a lot less over here in Alzheimer's, do you notice how small this is compared to the norm, even the normal 75 year old? That's a lot less. And that's concerning for us. That, that clues us into something's going wrong. But notice mild cognitive impairment looks very similar to normal. So we have to be careful in what we do and how we work people up and we need to give people the benefit of the doubt because treating early is always gonna be better than treating late. So there's other ways that we can look at the brain. There's other neuroimaging. This is called an FDG PET. And ultimately what it does is it measures the glucose uptake of the brain. So your brain is a muscle and it likes to eat. And so when we are observing the glucose uptake in the brain, we can see which areas are really excited and happy to be there and which areas are sleepy. The sleepy areas are not ideal because we want our brain to be active. We want it to be bright. We want it to be bright colors like the rainbow. But over here, we start seeing that's not so much. We start seeing some coldness, some sleepiness. And right here, that's kind of in our parietal lobes, which is where we were talking about there might be some pathology, right? So that gets a little concerning, but that's why we use some other scans instead is to help us understand a little bit more. And then we know that an amyloid PET, which is a different type of PET scan, amyloid PET shows us how much amyloid. So before we were measuring glucose, how delicious the brain is taking up food. But now this is a different variation of that where we can see how much amyloid is in the brain, which is really important because we know when we talked about earlier, amyloid deposition, that can make us think, okay, maybe there's some Alzheimer's at play. So we can actually look at amyloid on a PET scan, which is a fairly recent development. We didn't always have this, so this is excellent. And we can tell that there's a progression. We've done studies that show it starts in the hippocampus, but then it kind of wheels around and then becomes very prevalent throughout the brain in end-stage disease. So we know it's a progressive disease. So we got to stop it early, hence why evaluation early is so important. We also know that when we want to evaluate early, there are barriers to that diagnosis. Um, you could, it's just normal aging. We have a lot of patients who come in and say, oh, I think it's just normal aging, but their family members are like, you know what? It wasn't always like this. I don't know if it's just normal. Can you just reassure me? And we can, we can do that too. Sometimes evaluation is not easily attainable. Sometimes we have patients from three, four hours away. And, and especially on Zoom, I'm so happy we have so many Zoom people because this information is important and lack of access to care should not be a barrier to a diagnosis. So we always want to, want to help everyone that we can. Evaluation can be time consuming. Um, Sarah Kelly and I are working on an interdisciplinary clinic so that we can maximize the resources and work up for everyone who comes in through this door and be able to help you guys the most because it can be time consuming. Um, sometimes you'll need a lot more resources and need to talk about safety if it's so far progressed. So that's something really important that we have to consider when we're diagnosing someone. And then we'd already mentioned normal aging. And then a lot of people recently in what I've talked about, the, there's this belief that physicians and patients and caregivers and really the general public think that Alzheimer's <laughs> isn't treatable. And that's not true. We are on such a cool path now. We have our first medicine, Lakembi, is the infusion. And it's the first step that we're taking towards a cure. It is not a cure. I want to be very clear. Lakembi is not a cure. But it can prevent the progression of Alzheimer's, which we've never been able to really do before by 30%. And that's so exciting. We're in such a cool time to be in neurology. And it's a great time to be in Alzheimer's because we're almost there. We're so close. And this is our good first step. So, sorry, I, I get really excited about that because it's, <laughs> it's such a special thing. I remember, you know, when I was in school, um, my grandfather was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, which is what got me into all of this. And I was like, one day I'm going to, I'm going to treat Alzheimer's, but I never realized that it would be this kind of treatment. I thought treatment like supportive care, you know, giving resources, helping the family through whatever they might need. But now we're on the track to an actual cure. We're so close. So it makes me happy. So thank you guys for being here and listening to my TED talk. <laughs>
So the clinical disease progression, we go from mild to moderate to severe, right? That makes sense. It's a, it's a spectrum. And at the mild point, we have our cognitive symptoms. So family members or patients saying, you know, I'm having a little bit of memory problems. So that's what we've talked about. And on this graph, you can see that it's the years from diagnosis. For the people in the back, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> it's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years from diagnosis. And on, the, on this left side, when we said that it can be time consuming in the clinic, we give neurologic testing while we're in the clinic. I typically give a MOCA, most primary care is given MMSC. They're all just paper tests that we have the patient take so that we can get a baseline of their thinking. Is that like the slums? It is very similar. Yep. They all kind of group together in how is your brain functioning? Um, I personally like the MOCA, but that's just me. Um, but yeah, so we have our MMSC, which is the mini mental status exam. And we're basically evaluating patients on how are they doing there versus what we think they're going to have based off of how many years of diagnosis. So we said, you know, you're, you're scoring perfectly. A 30 is, is a perfect score. You might score pretty high and still have some symptoms, but still have like a mild cognitive impairment one to two years afterwards. But then as the years progress, we start getting into moderate and severe problems. So for example, the diagnosis typically comes when it's very obvious to other people that there's memory problems. And then we have loss of functional dependence. Once you're unable to do your finances, if you need help with your medicines, that's when we start to wonder, okay, might there be a dementia involved? There's some moderate cognitive impairment. And then it gets to the point where we become severe and we require nursing home placement and there's agitation and, and it's not their fault. It's not the patient's fault that they're so agitated or aggressive. Um, it's just the way that their pathology is in their brain. So it's important to understand that as well. It's really not their fault. Another thing that we want to make sure to mention is that we talk about a 24 being the cutoff for safe driving in Alzheimer's. Um, that's just something a lot of people talk to us about. They always wonder like, hey, I don't know if my significant other, my, my whomever is safe to drive. Usually if you have an understanding of, I'm not sure if they should be driving, usually that's a clue to us they probably shouldn't be driving because you're with them all the time. You know them better than we do. And so if you have a concern, then we have a concern. But ultimately, we usually use the 24 as the cutoff of a safe driving in an MMSC. And it's different for a MOCA and, and the other testing that we'll do. We know that the MMSC, that, that test that we give, we know those scores correlate with functional ability. So like we have down here, MMSC score, 30 is the highest, and then it's decreasing down to a level of zero. So that's on this x-axis. And then on this y-axis, we have activities of daily living, and those are all labeled out here. And you can tell that as your score goes down, which means as your disease progresses, you tend to lose more and more functionality. This is like what we were talking about with like the managing finances, managing medication, keeping doctor's appointment, being able to function on a telephone, getting a meal or snack or traveling alone that will slowly you know, decrease to the point where maybe you can't use your oven or your microwave, you can't find your belongings, you tend to like lose them, but you can't find them. So things like that. And then that progresses to the ability where you need help dressing, and you need help grooming, and you may be a messy eater, and then you maybe you need some help cutting up your food. And then ultimately, um, walking and eating can be impaired as well because it is a progressive neurodegenerative disease. So how do we get from normal to dementia? What's the process? Well, in between these two, there's a spectrum, right? And that's what we call mild cognitive impairment. That's what a lot of patients come in with when they say, I'm having memory problems. You've already identified to us that you feel like your memory is inappropriate. And so that almost always will tell us, okay, there's some sort of mild cognitive impairment. And that's very generic. That just tells us that something's going on that we need to look for it. So it's not a big deal. It's just the fact that we need to look and make sure that you're optimized on all your medications. Are you using your CPAP if you have sleep apnea? Are you smoking? Don't do that. That sort of thing. It's helping us to optimize you. And so the first step is where on the cognitive spectrum are you? And that's where we're trying to figure out when you come in. That's where we're assessing you. And then ultimately that decline in cognition happens first. Again, short-term memory problems. 
but then it's progressing to a decline in function, which is what we were just talking about before. The ADLs is what we call it, activities of daily living. Those get impaired. And when those are impaired, then we get more concerned that there might be a dementia at play. So what are you gonna expect when you come to a doctor's visit? Well, we are gonna collect all your medical history. You're gonna be sick of filling out surveys and questionnaires because we wanna know everything. You'll have a survey and questionnaire to fill out, and then I will additionally ask you more questions after you fill that out and I've reviewed it. We'll do a physical and a neurological examination. I'll make sure that there's nothing concerning on your exam that could make me think that there might be a stroke causing memory problems or Parkinson, because that can happen too. We'll do some bedside mental status testing, like you said, the slums, the MMSE, the MOCA. If you're with me, you're getting the MOCA. <laughs> and so we just test at the baseline. It shouldn't be something that's scary. A lot of patients say they come in and they're scared because they're like, I'm going to fail this test. And that's okay. it's okay if you fail because I'm not looking whether you pass or fail. That's not really what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is where is your baseline functioning? Where are the problems in your brain that are maybe causing you a little bit more distress and how can I find the diagnosis so I can treat you best? So it's not a matter of passing or failing. It's a matter of where are you at right now? And I think that helps a lot of patients feel better about the, the test because it, it's not a pass-fail test. <laughs> so, uh, and then we also will do some labs. If we need to, we'll do neuroimaging. A lot of our patients come in with MRIs before um, they even see us. And so we will always typically request those MRIs before they get here or after you've seen us in order to not have to undergo another MRI if it's been within a year, we'll get another one. And that can help us see if there's been any progression, which is also really helpful. We talked about all those PET scans earlier that can help us see amyloid or the FDG PET to see if there's glucose there. Those are all a lot of words that, <laughs> and a lot of acronyms that ultimately help us see what's happening in the brain. And then we'll do neuropsych testing sometimes um, like we said, we do a lot of our own mental status testing, our, our bedside mental status testing, so we don't always need neuropsychology testing, but that's a test that they would do in another place, usually at main campus, and it's like a three-hour test, and they really get down into the nitty-gritty. And so if there's any concern that we have, or if someone's normal and we're not quite sure, maybe they're developing Alzheimer's because they have a family history, or they've had things done in the past where we're concerned about that, then we would pursue that. It's not often, but we do still have that resource available. And then there's other things like an EEG. If you tell us that you're having memory problems, but you're having certain things that sound like a seizure, then we're going to work you up for that and make sure, because our job is to figure out what's causing the memory problems, not just to diagnose you with something. We want to figure out what the problem is, right? And sometimes that comes with a lumbar puncture to see any further things like Alzheimer's, or if there's an infection, or if we think there's an autoimmune problem where the body might be attacking itself. Those are all things that we think of when, we, when you come into to an exam. And so if we're suspecting dementia, or respecting cognitive impairment in some capacity, this is just a flow chart of basically how this happens. So you have a memory complaint, you or your significant other, whomever, have a memory complaint, and you seek medical consult, whether that be from your primary <coughs> care, whether that be from your geriatologist, whether that be through us, all, all equal channels. Once you get to that point, once you get to that office visit, they'll do the neuro exam and cognitive evaluation, like we mentioned, and then possible neuropsych evaluation referral. Again, that will help us delineate certain pathologies that we may not have been able to cover on the exam because we are, are fairly limited to an hour on our new consult time. So we can't do everything always. And then we get our imaging in our labs and we look for reversible causes. Like I said, if you're low in thyroid, that's something we can easily fix. And that can absolutely improve your cognition. So that's something that we look for. We also look to establish the diagnosis of dementia. Like we said, when you're having troubles with your daily living. And then we define what kind of dementia. Remember, dementia is an umbrella term. So we're saying whether you have it or not. And then we need to subdivide what kind of dementia do you have? Like what's causing that dementia? And then we treat the type of dementia and the related symptoms. We have several medications for memory loss. The ones that we typically use and are fairly well tolerated are cholinesterase inhibitors. Um, that's just a big word that basically means that the brain loves acetylcholine. And when we give a medicine to promote that, people tend to do a little bit better. They're subjective. Um, Memory thinking, language, judgment, and other thought processes seem to improve. Not a whole lot, 
but enough so that there is definitely a change at home, which is, is what we want. We want to change at some point. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you repeat what the brine loves? What was that? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm not going into the pathology of the okay. actual drug. I always wanted to research it. But yeah, absolutely. Okay. Acetylcholine. Yep. And the brain likes it. It helps excite the, the synapses in the brain in order to help us think better. And so the medicines that we choose to help us do that are Aricept, that's the name brand, or Dinepazil is usually what we recommend because we feel like it's about the same. And we also have something where it's a patch because some people will tend to say, you know, I had some nausea, some vomiting, some diarrhea with the Dinepazil. That's because the GI stomach doesn't like acetylcholine. And so we'll say, okay, if you couldn't tolerate, most people do, but if you can't tolerate that, we'll give you an excellent patch. You just put it on your arm, same concept, and it doesn't go through the GI system, it goes straight into your bloodstream, and so there's less side effects. The problem with why we don't do that is because insurance doesn't like to go straight there. Once again, insurance telling us how to do our jobs. Um, and then if we get to a certain point where we're like, okay, we've been optimized on the Tenefazil or the Rivastigmine patch, we're still having some concerns of dementia. We go to plan number two, which is an, an MDA receptor antagonist. And basically that's just a big word that means that it will help also improve memory, attention, reason, language, and the ability to perform simple tasks. We usually reserve this for people who are more at like the moderate to later stages of dementia. I've seen it used a little bit earlier, you know, if we know what, what is going on and it's progressive. But for the most part, we stick with denepazil first. And if you progressively get worse, then we'll add Nivenda later on. So in this graph, this was a study done um, a while ago, but it showed that treatment, treatment benefits were lost when denepazil was discontinued. So this graph just basically tells us that on this x-axis, we have number of weeks of taking a medicine, the Y is the mean change in, it's called the ADAS COG score, but ultimately that's another assessment of brain function. Excuse me. And these different colors represent different drugs or non-drugs that we gave. So there's denepazil at one, um, at five milligrams at one dose, denepazil at 10 milligrams, which is the preferred dose, placebo, which means we give them a sugar pill, and then denepazil 10 milligrams, um, it was open label, so they knew that they were getting the denepazil, everything else was just blinded, they didn't know what medicine they got. And then this gray area is the expected decline in untreated patients. So we had all of our bases covered and every possible permutation of what could happen. And we saw that with the denepazil 10, we had a good mean change. So after a couple of weeks went by, we saw that there was a good change in patients who were taking the denepazil both five and 10. And so that made us think, okay, well, denepazil is doing a good thing. But then when we took it off, the washout phase, meaning we took it out, they weren't taking it, and it took a while you know, to get it out of your system, we noticed that they were still a little bit better than what was expected, but they had still declined quite a bit than what you would expect from these lines. So ultimately, a lot of patients come in and say, you know, I don't really see a whole lot in the denepazil. Like, I, I, it's not truly changing anything. We understand that it's more of a prevention of progression. We wanna make sure that we can stave off the progression of the disease as much as possible. And this graph shows that. While we're not, sometimes we can see a little bit boost in memory and functioning at home, but clinically speaking, we're really just trying to prevent the, the progression of the disease as much as possible. I have a question. Yeah. Did you come back and do a study without the washout phase? That's a great question. I did not do this study. Huh. Um, this was somewhere else. But I would have to look that up for you. Right. I'm not sure. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about the research in general, we say the combination of cholinesterase inhibitors and the NMD receptor antagonists, the, the two class of medicines that we just talked about, um, they're the best combination for someone with memory impairment. So this is a graph that shows the, the years, right, from, from diagnosis. And on, on the y-axis, it's the predicted mean BBS score, which again is memory functioning. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of bedside memory testing that we can do. So we, we like to play around with some of the memory testing that's available. And on the blue line, we see that it's the denepazil, the cholinesterase, and the mantine. So, so both of those medicines. And we see that as years progress, their predicted mean 
doesn't go down quite as low as with no medicine. In no medicine, they will get worse a little bit quicker. And even if we had denepazil, meaning like the colonetic monotherapy, so just Aricept, we say they do not quite as well as with both, but still do better than the placebo. So ultimately this shows that having both in the appropriate setting is important for us to stave off as much progression as possible. So now I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys are wanting to know about this, <laughs> the lecanemi. And this is what we were talking about earlier and we're so excited about, it. it's called lecanemab. You'll hear it said both ways. Um, like we said before, it is not a cure for Alzheimer's. We just wanna manage expectations. We're not there yet. We're getting there, but we're not at a cure yet. However, we've shown that this can slow the progression of disease. So when we take this in combination with the oral medicines that we have, we can slow it by up to 30%. And that's something that we really like because that's quality of life, in our opinion. We're giving back months of quality of life that you wouldn't necessarily have otherwise had. So we had this FDA approved, I believe it was in July of 2023, and it's an infusion every two weeks. Um, a lot of people ask, is it the right thing for me? And there's several things that have to kind of line up in order to get the Lakembi. Um, First of all, to be eligible, you need to have myocognitive impairment. We've abbreviated it MCI or be in the early stages of Alzheimer's. So not the end stage, but towards the beginning. We know that if there's a little, if you're too far along, there's an increased risk to taking the medicine. And so we, we tend to shy away from people if they're at the end stage or severe, it might be too dangerous for them to get this medicine. So that's why we say early stages or myocognitive impairment. We will get blood work um, to help us understand, you know, do you have Alzheimer's in your blood? There's some serum tests that are in research and being developed um, that we can use. We will potentially get an amyloid PET scan, like we talked about, to see if you have amyloid in your brain. If you don't have amyloid, we can't remove it with lecanemi because it's the whole point. So if you don't have amyloid, we can't give you the medicine because it's not really going to work. It's not going to do anything. And then it's just a waste of your money. We also do um, lumbar punctures. There is fluid that bathes the brain in a bath every day. And there's a little pocket at the end of your spinal cord that we can take fluid from. We do it every Friday. We have our lumbar puncture clinic. And so it's a very simple, quick procedure. Um, it's a procedure nonetheless, but we do them very quickly and then you're out of here. We do genetic testing for your ApoE status. And I think we go into that in a little bit, but if not, um, we do genetic testing to see if there's a genetic risk that would increase your risk for Alzheimer's. That same gene can increase your risk for side effects on this medicine, which is why it's so important for us to evaluate it. Okay. And then we get our MRIs because, again, we want to make sure that we're making the right diagnosis. We combine all of those together, the MRI, the lumbar puncture, the PET, if you get it. We combine all of those with your history to figure out your diagnosis. And then it's not for everyone. Sometimes your MRIs and you wouldn't know it, sometimes your MRIs show things that will make it unable for us to actually treat you with this medicine. For example, if you had microhemorrhages, you might never know, but if you have a certain amount of microhemorrhages, which is small little bleed in the brain, we would think that the risk might outweigh the benefits. Okay, so that's why it's so important for us to get an MRI is because we can, be, can predispose to some bleeding in the brain, and we do not want to run the risk if we don't think it's appropriate. Okay. Is a mini stroke, is that, does that count as? Uh, Are you talking about a TIA? Yeah. It, it depends on what the MRI shows because a lot of people will get diagnosed with a TIA but then don't get an MRI. So we actually don't know if it's an actual stroke or a TIA. But for the most part, TIAs are not a barrier to getting with Kennedy. <laughs> Um, and then for blood thinners, sometimes if you are on a blood thinner and you've had concerns of bleeding in the past, like in your brain or what have you, then it might not be the best idea for you to be on this medicine. Like we said, sometimes there's a risk of bleeding in the brain. And if you're on a blood thinner and you're already at risk, if we did some genetic testing that would increase your risk for bleeding, that's a little bit, that's a lot of risk. And so it's a discussion with you to decide, is it worth it or not? So again, making that decision with you is very important. So now we'll talk about uh, behavioral symptoms in dementia. Oh, I'm going to do um, we talk about a lot of different behavioral things that can happen in a dementia etiology. Like whatever dementia you have, there's a lot of different behavioral symptoms that can come with that. 
So we have another graph. Um, this x-axis shows the months before and after diagnosis. So this red line shows when theoretically we're diagnosed with a dementia. This is months after, and then this is months before. So what this means is even before your diagnosis, we can already tell that some patients, and this is frequency, more frequent is at the top, lower frequency is at the bottom. We can already tell that some people in dementia are already having depression or anxiety even before their diagnosis. Now, does this mean that depression, anxiety are causing your Alzheimer's? No, that's not at all what's happening. However, there might be a correlation where there's changes happening already in the brain that are predisposing you to that pathology that we're trying to diagnose you with. And it might be a clue in to say, okay, we'll just keep an eye on you a little bit closer because we know they can be related. And there's other things like um, social withdrawal, very minimally suicidal ideation. But then after your diagnosis, we tend to see the mood changes that are that I'm sure you guys have probably heard more frequently with Alzheimer's, so like the wandering. Sometimes there's socially unacceptable behaviors, especially in public. Um, sometimes there can be um, uh, delusions or hallucinations. Most frequently, we tend to see the wandering and the agitation. And at the end stage, we typically will see some aggression because as the, as the disease progresses, our frontal lobe loses the ability to keep us in check. And so that way, sometimes those things can happen at the end of our, of our diagnosis. So what could be the causes of these behaviors? It's not that the patient is wanting to do this. It's just that this is what's happening. It's a reaction to something that's happening inside of them. Sometimes, like for example, when I was on the inpatient service at UK, we had many patients who had dementia or cognitive impairment. And in the middle of the night, they would start getting aggressive to our staff. You know, things would happen. And instead of going straight to a medication to settle them down, we would make sure that we identify their basic needs because maybe they're at a point where they're delirious and they can't tell us what they need. If they're in the hospital or if they're at home, are they in pain? That's a great thing to consider. They may not be able to tell you that they're in pain. So third, like they can be thirsty, hungry, in pain. There might be distress. They might be feeling anxiety because they felt abandonment. Like if you walked into the other room, they might have such severe memory problems. They forgot you left and now they're isolated. And so that might be just a part where we um, like redirect them and say, hey, you know, I'm here. What do you need? Try and elucidate like what is going on. And if not, just figuring out the best next step. Um, environmental factors can also play a role. So having excessive stimulation, um, if, you know, if a lot of people are coming over, that can sometimes be too stimulating for our patients. Um, if there's not a good daily structure routine, I always tell my patients change is the best thing you can do for a patient with dementia because it almost becomes muscle memory, not true memory. Like every day they're doing their crossword puzzle at 9 a.m. And then at 10 a.m. they're doing a different puzzle. And keeping their mind active is really great in general, but it can also help with, you know, uh, behavioral problems. Having a, a schedule that they can roughly follow is really important. It's a really great thing. Um, inadequate lighting. Sometimes our patients can't see very well. And if the lights are down, that makes them even more concerned because they're stressed because they can't see. Hearing is another great thing. I always tell my patients, get your eyes and ears checked every year because it's really important to be able to interact with your environment appropriately. You have to see and hear. And so if that's impaired, then that might make your cognition a little bit worse. Um, confusing surroundings, more demands. And if other people are being distressed or like anxious in the family, that they can also, they can feel that emotion and they can feel that without being able to describe what they're feeling. Um, Behavior prevention, like we mentioned, like I mentioned in my example, is just so important. Um, providing that structured, secure, and safe environment and maintaining the routines, having a routine, and it doesn't have to be crosswords and Sudoku. It can be whatever you find that a good routine would be that's right for you and your family. Encouraging constructive activities and social interactions, um, encouraging them to remain social is a very important thing. Having that isolation is not good. We are by nature, as humans, we are by nature social creatures. And so as people tend, I've heard a lot of patients tell me as they tend to get worse with their memory, they're ashamed or they're scared or they feel like they're gonna be judged by other people. 
And I, I hate when I hear that because that's not fair. You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of other pa patients also feel similar way. And so that's why we do support groups. That's why we have such good collegiality with our, with our caregiver support groups and everything is because we need to make sure that they're not isolated. We need to make sure that they're welcome and, and included in a group setting because that's so important for their behavior and for their progression. Um, we also want to make sure that they're getting their doctor's checkups, their medical and physical conditions, whatever that might be. We need to support the caregiver because they're the primary source of giving that support to the patient. But there is certainly caregiver fatigue. We've done so many studies on that, and it's exhausting because you weren't necessarily volunteering to be in that role years ago. You didn't know that that was going to happen, right? But you are so loving and you are so caring that you're like, I will give of my time. But that wasn't necessarily expected. So there can be that, that emotional conflict. And that's okay. And again, that's why having these, these workshops is so important is so that we can come together and be there for emotional support for each other. Um, ensuring adequate nutrition and sleep. Eventually, at some point, like we had mentioned earlier, some people don't like to eat quite as much. So getting, you know, boosts on board, eating small, frequent meals sometimes is good. So making sure that they're getting nutrition, making sure they're not having too much weight loss. But ultimately, when we treat the dementia first with the medicines that we talked about, the oral medicines, the cholinesterase inhibitors, and the mamatine, that tends to actually help quite a bit of these behaviors. Getting the dementia under control with these medications is typically something that can work really well. And then there are ultimately other behavioral interventions that we can consider. Like I mentioned, we would um, redirect and distract our patients on the inpatient service quite a bit. Um, we would just say, oh, you know, you'll, you'll go home in the morning, just go to sleep now. And the, the faster you'll go to sleep, the sooner you can get out of the hospital. And they would be like, oh, okay. Because they were worried or they didn't know. Sometimes calling um, family members on the phone or seeing them in person would be very helpful. Like if they had seen their family all day, they would actually sleep very well at night because they were reassured that their family was there because they could remember that there was that face that they knew. They may not know the name or how they're related, but a reassuring face is always very helpful. Um, adjusting the environment is sometimes also necessary to avoid precipitating factors. Um, you may need to meet the needs and limitations of your patient. If your patient, you know, if you're, if you're, um, loved one is unable to see because they have macular degeneration, maybe helping them um, a little bit more with a more tactile stimulation. You know, they, they may not be able to see the Sudoku, but they can maybe do puzzles and feel around the edges to see, you know, to keep their mind active in that way. So meeting them wherever their needs may be is really important. And then um, avoiding overstimulation. We mentioned having a structured, uh, a structured schedule is helpful, but it doesn't have to be like booked every day. It's whatever, you know, they, whatever you find works for them, right? You just don't want them to sit in front of a TV all day, having them be active in some component, um, you know, helping out with chores around the house if they still can, um, or giving them, uh, you know, laundry to do. It may not, and it's okay, it may not be the way that you put laundry away, like the way you fold it, but even just giving them that job is so important because that is giving them a sense of purpose and giving them something to do. So it's it's important. Um, I speak from experience. My grandfather loved to fold laundry. He did not know how to do it at the end. Like he was folding it in a very interesting way. And then we were like, thank you. Thank you so much for helping. I appreciate that. So he had that emotion of, I did something good. And I don't know if y'all noticed, but these patients with Alzheimer's, they will remember the emotion. They will remember how you made them feel. They won't remember why they feel that way or how they felt that way, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So if you can make them feel good, then that's excellent. Something really, really good. And then, um, like we said, planned activities to avoid boredom. That also involves socialization. We have resources for that too. The medications for behavior, I don't know if y'all saw this, but Rexpiprazole was just FDA approved for uh, Alzheimer's dementia. It actually, it actually popped up on my YouTube ad, which I was surprised. I'm like, I'm Googling Alzheimer's too much. Um, <laughs> but they ultimately, all of the antipsychotics, which sounds you know really intense, but it's just a brand of medicine that helps with agitation, right? But our patients can't prevent themselves from feeling that agitation. So sometimes 
in times where redirection isn't available or they're becoming aggressive to the point where they are hurting themselves or others and redirection is not helping, then we might go towards a medication like an antipsychotic. All of the medicines that we typically use for psychosis of aggression, those come with a black box warning. That means that the FDA, when we did our studies, it showed that there was an increased risk of morbidity and mortality, which ultimately translates to there was an increased risk of stroke and or death in patients who took that medicine. So obviously that's not what we want for our patients. We don't want them to have that side effect, but if they're already hurting themselves and others, it kind of turns the tide on the benefits of that medicine might be worth the risks. So that's always something that we can consider. We prefer redirection. We prefer other non-chemical <laughs> modalities in order to help with delirium and behavior, but there are other options that exist. And it's very limited in regards to all of the, the medications that we have. There's no clear consensus. Um, and unfortunately, we just, we just have to treat the patient, you know, whatever the patient might have. Like, for example, we can use other um, psychiatric medications to help with anxiety and depression. And that can help with feeling, you know, anxious in general. Like, there are certain medicines, for example, if they can't sleep and they're losing weight, we have a medicine called mirtazapine that works really well. It helps with sleeping and with remembering to eat. It's a great medicine and it can help with anxiety and depression as well. So there's certain medications that we have that can really help with multiple modalities, but we have to meet where your needs are. Okay. Um, just based off of uh, desired side effects. Like I said, mirtazapine has that side effect of sedation. For someone who's sleeping all day, that's not a great medicine for them. But for a patient who doesn't sleep at night, it's a great medicine. So we, we, we try to, you know, integrate into what's what the patient needs. Ultimately, if you do notice changes in behavior, call your clinician. The reason why we say this is because, remember earlier when we said there's changes in behavior, it can be pain or sickness or hunger. Sometimes patients will have a urinary tract infection. If suddenly your loved one is like going off the walls and you're like, I have no idea what happened. They just started acting like this one day and it's been going on for a couple of days. Maybe they have a urinary tract infection. They can't tell you that they're in pain. They can't tell you that they're having issues. So having your primary care or your clinician check a UA, um, check to see if they have a pneumonia, you know, things like that, whatever symptoms they might be having. That's really important. That's something we do quite a bit just in general to make sure that there's nothing else going on that could make them uncomfortable in any way. So, decent time. What questions do you guys have? I know that was quite a bit of information. But I'm curious what y'all, and if you have comments too, I welcome comments. Yeah. My sister's online. She asked a question. Um, okay. She was taking an ancestry DNA test and wondered if that would uh, give her any indication of a familial. Um, Probably not. Um, they, they didn't have this on here, but the genetic test we test for is APOE. It's apolipoprotein E. <laughs> And I might, uh, I might actually put that on our next slides, maybe, because um, I think that would be really helpful, especially since we're getting it for so many people. But apolipoprotein E, it's a great question, by the way. Thank you, Zoom person. Um, apolipoprotein E is a allelic inheritance, which is a big word that means when you were born, you got one copy of DNA from your mom and one copy of DNA from your dad. And so you have two alleles is what we call it. one allele from mom, one allele from dad. When we have a certain number, there's E2, like able E2, E3, E4. If we have a specific number, that represents from the studies that we've done a particular risk for Alzheimer's. So if you actually have E3, E3, like you got E3 from mom, E3 from dad, that's almost like a net zero right? That's just kind of, you know, no, no particular increase in risk. However, if you have an E4 from mom, or if you have an E4 from mom and dad, that's going to increase your risk for Alzheimer's. And that in turn, we have studies that show will increase your risk for potential problems with the Lakembi that we talked about. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of ARIA at all, but with the Lakembi, Sometimes we can have side effects of swelling in the brain or bleeding in the brain. As we're taking out that amyloid, if people have a lot of amyloid, 
that's a lot of disruption to the brain. The brain doesn't like to be touched. And so unfortunately, a side effect can be bleeding or swelling. And if you have an E4, that's gonna increase your risk of bleeding. And if you have an E4, E4, that's very dangerous. There can be up to like a 40% chance of bleeding, I think is what the, the chart that I just saw. So that's, that's why we need to do that genetic testing. That's why we need to look at your MRI. If you had a bleed in the past and you, you would never have known maybe, if you have that genetic testing and you have an MRI that looks like that, I don't know if that's the best option for you treatment wise because the risk might outweigh the benefits. So that's a great question. Um, I don't think Ancestry.com does APOE genetic testing because I'm pretty sure that's still only in the realm of neurology. I could be wrong, but I do not think that that would be the same. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I have several questions. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the first is um, there is a school of thought that um, dementia or Alzheimer's disease is is a metabolic type disease and that uh, some people classify it as diabetes type 3, which made me wonder when you talked about the FDG PET scan, how it measures glucose uptake um, to show activity in the brain. Can you speak more on that? I can speak more about the FDG glucose in the setting of diabetes. I've not heard it described that way in the literature as type three diabetes. Um, we have clear evidence that shows that the amyloid plaques and the tau tangles are what's causing this problem. We're still doing research. There's always the potential to find new and different things. Like I said, we still haven't found a cure, so we still don't know. I would be less inclined to think about that as an etiology, like the diabetes type three. However, when you talk about the glucose, I just wanted to clarify, at normal, our brain is constantly taking up glucose in order to function. So the way that the PET scan works is that it's just understanding the uptake of the brain. Diabetes won't change how the brain functions in that, in that way, because the brain's always taking up glucose. It, it wouldn't necessarily be a change in that. Okay. It's a great question though. Thank but yeah, I, I don't think that that would be really good. Okay. And then are there um, certain types of holistic treatments that can be done that you have that have shown improvement in the brain, like hyperbaric oxygen chamber? Unfortunately, the research is not great for any of the other things that we've looked at. And let me um, just say, as far as resiliency is concerned, like if you're looking, if you have one copy of an APOE4 and you're really worried that you might have a higher chance, you can do things that make you resilient, like socialization, um, as Dr. Wojcicki was saying. Socialization is coming out, and the research is the best thing you can do for your brain health. And that, thank you, know. thank, thank you. you. Okay, um, and then let's see. Um, now, I I have read that um, long term smokers. It, it is unusual to see them as being diagnosed with dementia and Parkinson's. Have you also seen, have you seen that? They might not make it to that age. <laughs> honestly, <laughs> honestly, I was just going to say, honestly, the patients that I see who are smokers actually have terrible vascular dementia. Okay. Um, not necessarily Alzheimer's, not necessarily Parkinson's, but they tend to, after all of those years of smoking, it eats away at your blood vessels a little bit. Okay. Um, and more plaque forms up. That's why smoking increases your risk of stroke. Okay. Um, we find that a lot of our patients who smoke have vascular dementia, if that were to happen. Yeah, okay. if, they, if they come to us, I found that that's typically more common. So you don't see any benefit of introducing like nicotine patches? Oh, yeah, stop people. smoking. 100%. Yeah, don't smoke. I'm mean, <laughs> sorry, just to yeah. improve the health of the brain. Does no, nicotine there's have no evidence. improvement? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not that we've seen so far. Not so okay. Because um, the damage is already done. Okay. And I've noticed on your uh, slideshow that um, you were going by years as of uh, to monitor progression. Mm -hmm. Where do stages fit into that? Is it better to go by years instead of the stages? 
So the stages are a great universal normalization for our research studies. We meet everyone at whatever stage that they're at, and it does not follow a one size fit all. Okay. Someone can go from mild cognitive impairment to dementia very quickly. We call it rapidly progressive dementia. You can still have Alzheimer's, but one person could progress in six months. Another person could be four years. Another person could be eight years. And everyone's very individualized. We're still doing research on why that's the case. But ultimately, it's not a one size fit all. Everyone goes at their own pace. And so we typically go by diagnosis, not by years, but for research purposes to normalize everyone, typically years is a better indication. Thank you. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And type of diet. Um, mm, does, the, great does the diet help with progression or slowing the progression? The research is still out. I feel like it does. Okay. I have no research to back that up, but I feel like our diet is inextricably related to how our cognition functions. And the reason I say that is because if we're eating a diet high in fats, burgers, steaks, red meats, I found that they, you know, we, we know that they have an increased risk for stroke in general. And like we said, dementia is an umbrella term. Vascular dementia is very common. Um, we call we call dementia our, our stroke belt. We got good eats here. But unfortunately, those good eats tend to predispose us to cholesterol problems, hypertension, lots of salt, lots of fats. And so we find that as people tend to eat <clears throat> like that, their brains don't like that as much. And I, I call it schmutz, but but ultimately plaque will build up in the vessels of your brain and predispose you to cognition problems. So I completely agree. I don't, I don't have a way that diet is inextricably related to Alzheimer's, but with cognition in general, absolutely it's related. Okay. Yeah. I've heard that the keto diet is really good. I'm not going to comment on any specific diets. Okay. But there is research on the Sprint Mind diet that I would look up for Sprint yourself. Mind. So yeah. They've I done a lot of research on uh, FODMAP, uh, Mediterranean, um, there's been a couple, but uh, only you want to look at ORG or GOV in the web bar when you're looking for these articles. You okay. want to make sure they come from a reliable source. Well, Actually, you know Thank you. Thank you. Do you, do you, do you, uh, do you is there a natural way to get acetylcholine? Um, and not get it through. So acetylcholine is naturally occurring in the brain. We've just noticed that with that medication, we can improve it and then improve memory subtly. There is no evidence that there's other acetylcholine. Okay. Or, or at least none that I've seen any data for that would be safe. Okay. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Have you seen any correlation between Hashimoto's thyroid and dementia? Or Unless you have Hashimoto's um, steroid responsive encephalopathy, no. However, that's why we're testing thyroid, right? We want to make sure your thyroid's okay so your thyroid's not contributing to your cognitive problems. Okay. So if that's the case, like my mother, I'm here for her mm -hmm. and she does have Hashimoto's mm -hmm. um, and she still has her thyroid. Okay. Um, should, would she be better off having her thyroid removed? That no, way? that would be a question for your primary care because they will assess where her labs are. If she has a functioning thyroid in the sense that her free T4 is okay, um, that would be fine. But again, your, your primary care physician would know when to put you on medicine and okay. when it would be appropriate to remove. I would not recommend that okay. at, at all. You need your thyroid okay. and to, to artificially take it out would not be a good thing unless it was deemed necessary. If there was like a cancer or something that was, you know, contributing, um, okay. obviously very case dependent, but your primary care wouldn't have the best option for that. I would trust them for that. Okay. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Um, I do unfortunately have a research patient. Um, I think I think you have one question. Is it a quick question? Yeah. Okay. So I understand this this blood test that's um, still being tested, right? Or I don't know where, where that's at. But my yeah, question, my question is: Is it specific to Alzheimer's the dementia, or is it just dementia in general? So the way it worked was that the serum Alzheimer's that we were testing wasn't good at the beginning. 
and we keep doing research in order to get a better understanding of like the serum markers. We're getting to a point where we're getting there. We have different markers now. We just went to the AIC and there were better markers now that we're looking at. We still have to make sure that they're okay by everyone and that the research is still coming out. We don't typically go based off of serum amyloid here if we start to work you up for Lakembi. Um, we, when we work you up for Alzheimer's, we'll either do an amyloid PET or a lumbar puncture to look for uh, Alzheimer's. We'll look for amyloid that way because it's directly related to the CSF. We know that that information has been validated and we know that that has a way better sensitivity specificity than a serum. We're still working on serum. We're getting there, but not yet. Okay. Thank you guys so much. I'm so sorry. I hope I didn't cut you off. No, I have, you did. I okay, appreciate good. your answers. Of I course. Your it's, a, it's a very awesome, overwhelmingly complex field. The <laughs> questions were so insightful. They're absolutely wonderful. Keep the questions coming. I'm sorry I have to leave, but it was so great talking to you guys. And hopefully I'll see you in clinic. And I think I've yeah. seen a couple of you guys maybe in clinic already. So it's good to see you and best wishes. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a short break. Um, if you need a restroom, it's in the middle hallway. Um, there's more questions up here, and then we'll start back in about five minutes. My name is Sarah Hatch. I am one of the social workers here at Sanders Brown. A um, couple of things just real quickly. I forgot to mention at the beginning is that we will be sending out PowerPoint slides for all the presenters. Yeah. So um, afterwards, anybody who's registered, and I have your email address, I will send out the PowerPoint slides for every presentation um, and any handouts that any of the presenters want me to add or include, I will do that. So here um, in the next day or so, you'll get an email from me with all the PowerPoint. I have a question for you. The test she rec talked about the number from 30 to zero, uh -huh. is that the one that's executed here? So that's it. I think most of them is the MMSE. Well, there's it a lot is, of MMs floating around. There is, there's a ton Sorry. of acronyms. Um, each doctor has a little bit different of what they prefer. Like she said, she prefers the MOCA. There are some scales that we can use that will say, like, if you scored this on a MOCA, it equals this on an MMSE, it equals this on a COVID. Yeah. So they do have some of those scales to help kind of interpret some data. Okay. Um, and sometimes they'll run both. It really just depends on the Yeah, that's all I'm asking is just if how that matches up with what they're showing you. Yeah. Okay. So. I also want to kind of let you know a little bit about all the handouts because Kelly came and brought a couple of things up front as well. So we have some UK Donovan Scholar pamphlets um, for lifelong learning that are up here. It's a program theory to pay for senior adults, wide variety of activities. So one way to continue um, socialization. We have some information up here about genetics. Um, since Dr. Podrowski talked a little bit about the APOE, so a little bit more information about that if you're interested. Um, in your folders, you'll see something about Memory Cafe. That's something that Meredith, that Meredith and I run. Um, it's monthly, and it is based for socialization. So it's once a month that we gather together, those with the diagnosis and their loved one, and we have fun. Um, the topics change month by month, um, but the goal is just to have a place to come, interact with others that's safe. Um, we don't care if there's interruptions or if you have an off the wall comment, we roll with it, and then we enjoy uh, spending time with each other. So last month we had um, a shelter from Frankfurt come and bring some of their shelter animals and we got to play with dogs. Mm -hmm. um, this next month in September, we're going to have the Glitter Bugs, a dance group, uh, senior dance group come and they're going to show some of their dance moves and teach us some of their dance moves. But we've also had choirs come, athletes come, we play games, um, we do art. So we do a wide spectrum of things. So that's another socialization activity that's out there. On the table here, there are some books, A Dignified Life. Those are free copies. You're welcome to have one. Um, and if I run out, I can grab more. I have plenty. And then we also have Pathways, which is from the Area Agency on Aging. And Regina will talk about some of their resources here in a minute. But it's a great resource tool. It's for Lexington and surrounding areas. And it's a little bit of everything aging. Um, so it's not dementia specific, but it's a great resource uh, where there's different resources, lawyers, uh, home health care, um, you name it. It's kind of got a list of things. And it does it by county for all the counties that they um, represent. So it's 17 counties wide. So it's a very helpful. It's kind of like the phone book for senior resources. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really helpful. So with all that being said, we're going to jump into home safety. So when it comes to home safety, um, a goal for everybody, no matter 
who we are. We want our families to be safe. We want to be safe in our homes. And a lot of times we use safety awareness. So like our ability to plan, to prepare, um, and to respond to when something happens. So we know like if there's outlet covers, we need to cover them if we have small children in the home. We know there's certain things we need to keep away from flames to prevent fires. But what we know with different dementia diagnoses is, is that over time, their ability to prepare, to respond can be decreased. So we have to recognize that somebody who cares for them or loves them, that their safety awareness is declining, which means ours has to kind of increase to help counteract to help keep them safe in their home. So with home safety, again, our goal is always to have a safe environment. But the first thing we need to do um, is stop and evaluate the environment. So a lot of times, if you're in and out of your loved one's home a lot, or it's your home, sometimes you become blind to some of the things that need to get fixed. So sometimes it's taking a step back and kind of just really looking at the house and the environment, see are there things we need to change or adapt. And there are checklists out there that you can get that kind of go through room by room of a house to have things for you to think about and check on. Um, sometimes it's helpful to bring some new eyes in, a friend, a loved one who lives far away to come in and kind of just help go through the environment and see things that maybe you just haven't seen because you're used to. When we're looking at the environment also, we always want to think about adaptations. So we don't necessarily want to go in and change everything all at once. But if there's things that we can adapt or change just a little to make it safer, that's the goal. Uh, we want to be realistic too. So a lot of people are like, oh, I need to go in and get a whole new bathroom. You know, but realistically, that may take a lot of time, that may take a lot of money, um, and it may just not be realistic for your situation. So being realistic, because there are a lot of adaptations that can happen. And reaching out for help. So a lot of times you can ask a primary care provider to maybe have a home safety evaluation done with an occupational therapist. So somebody who can come into your home and can kind of help look, help figure out some of those adaptations, different medical equipment that's available that you may not know about because there's so many things and devices out there. But they can be the professional to come in and kind of help you evaluate your home and make some of those recommendations. So again, we know dementia, it's progressive disease or diseases, you know, it's an umbrella term, but we know that it affects a lot of different factors. Also realizing that it's a disease that affects everybody differently. So recognizing that the things that I'm gonna tell you are very generic, um, so everybody's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, but we know for sure that over time, judgment is impaired. Our sense in time and place can be affected. Our physical abilities diminish as well. And we know that our senses are all affected. So here, in the next few slides, we're going to go through kind of sense by sense and talk about some different safety things to think about. Um, judgment and sense of time and physical abilities kind of all line in between. So when we start with smell. We know smell can be a safety filter. We're sitting at home and all of a sudden we smell something burning. We know, oh, we forgot that cake. We need to go grab it out of the oven. Um, we open the refrigerator, get some milk out, take off the lid. We can smell sometimes that it's sour. Oh, that's bad. We know not to drink it. But with time, smell just in general can decline and not be as strong. Um, but also sometimes the processing of this is I smell something bad and connecting it to the milk has gone bad can be diminished. So things we tell people to look for are making sure you've got smoke alarms in different places. Sometimes making sure the smoke alarms are more than just noise, maybe noise and light, so that there's different signals coming in. Um, being aware of chemicals um, and how we have our kitchens, our bathrooms set up, because a lot of times we have a lot of different things. We'll have food and chemicals, our clean things are there in the kitchen or the bathroom as well. But that sense of smell sometimes is gone. So if I grab the bleach, I can smell the bleach when I open it up. But if that sense of smell is not there or that knowing exactly what it is, I could grab it and it could be the wrong thing. Um, same thing comes with body odors and just personal hygiene. Um, sometimes we can't smell ourselves and then we don't know that we need to take a bath or we think we took a bath yesterday and we don't realize we haven't taken a bath in two weeks. So being aware of body odors and kind of using that as clues to kind of help as you navigate caregiving. And again, food in the kitchen, checking the refrigerator, um, the pantry to make sure that food is good and that it hasn't gone bad. <clears throat> When it comes to taste, um, we know smell can affect taste, but things we also want to be aware of are choking hazards. So sometimes we have magnets on the refrigerator that may look like food. If we can't taste anything and we see something that looks like an orange, we might grab it and try to eat it. Or if we have, you know, beautiful fruit baskets all full of fake fruit, not realizing 
that's fake, not really tasting anything, we might try to grab it and eat it. We may eat the whole thing not realizing that it's fake. Um, so be aware of that. Again, simplifying the environment. Same thing with smells, taste. You never know what you grab if it's not the right thing. And so it's also important, especially within the kitchen area, knowing Heimlich remover, you know, if they get something lodged, you know, having the skills to remove that, having the number for poison control in case they get into something they shouldn't, having it posted is always helpful. When it comes to hearing and sight, um, one thing to remember is that a lot of times our processing speed declines through time. So sometimes we may say something and it could take multiple seconds, more than just, you know, what us to respond. So if somebody says, what would you like to drink? It could take 10, 15 seconds to get that message in, process it, and then respond. That's a lot longer than most any of us are used to. And so realizing when we're communicating that that processing speed could be slowing down is important to keep in mind. Um, but when it comes to safety, we need to remember that because again, smoke alarms, we use a lot of alarms and things to help us with safety. And if it's taking us a lot longer to process, we're losing precious moments sometimes when it comes to safety. So that's why we talk about smoke detectors that have not only sound, but light. Sometimes they'll say things like, please leave the house, emergency. Um, can be helpful just to get you lots of different sensory inputs to try to help move along. Um, with noise, our ears or hearing, also being aware of excessive noise. Dr. Bojaska talked a little bit about that, but it can be a very irritating thing. If there's too many sensories going on, if there's too much noise, um, so being aware of that. Because if you're in an environment that's very crowded and it's very noisy and you just want to get out, you might find your loved one just leaves. And if you're not paying attention, you don't know where they went, but they're really just trying to get to a quiet spot. Um, but it may not be super noisy that you think, but for them, all of a sudden, multiple conversations can be just incredibly overwhelming. Um, I kind of talked about that, having plants with lights and alarms. Um, and then another thing that's important is alerting emergency services. So here in Fayette County, there is Smart 911, which is something you can register online for. And basically what it's letting them know, um, if you, they got a phone call from your phone number or certain phone numbers or go to that address, you can alert them there's someone in that home that has dementia. Um, so it kind of helps give those first responders a heads up when they're heading to your home or get a call to know what to expect. So if, an escal if a situation is escalated, they know to come in and help de-escalate. Um, and so it's just alerting, again, responders. Hmm. Lights are important. Um, Dr. Wojcicki talked about that too. Um, you want to have a well-lit area, not only to help make sure you can see, um, but it's also for safety. You want to make sure that you can see the floor around you. Um, we also find that when we get the dimmer lights, there can be confusion. We hear that about sundowners. Um, at dusk, a lot of times, because it's not fully light, it's not fully dark. So what time is it? Is it bedtime? Is it morning? Um, so that can be a really confusing time. So helping have things well lit can kind of help shave that off some. Also with our vision, how we interpret what we see can be affected. So when we have a lot of shadows, um, all of a sudden that shadow from the coat rack could become a person and that can be really scary. Um, so just being aware of that and how our, our sight and our perceptions can change. Um, another thing to kind of be paying attention to is mirrors. As the disease progresses, and usually we see this in the moderate or late stages, seeing images in the mirror, even themselves, can be scary. It can be a different person. Um, even yourself, a reflection in the mirror, that could be an extra person. So just being mindful of how they might interpret images. And so sometimes it's having to take a step back and kind of say, all right, so let's relook at this environment in a different way. And what, what, may they, what might they be seeing during the time of being touched? So that's the same thing with depth perception um, and creating contrast. So I've got some pictures here in a minute I'll show you. But a lot of times we hear about on the floors, if all of a sudden there's like a change from one type of flooring to another, and it happens to be a very dark flooring, that depth perception to them may be perceived as just a hole. And so they don't want to go onto that flooring because it looks like they're stepping into nothing. Um, and so they can get scared. We've seen people use that to their advantage. Sometimes if they have a loved one who wanders, a big black mat in front of a door, their loved one might perceive it as a hole and stop and not go through that door. So that can be a good thing, but sometimes it can be frustrating when you're in a hurry and you're going, you're going, all of a sudden they're stopping and they don't want to go. And you're like, come on, come on, come on. And you just have to stop, think, look. Maybe that flooring, there's something about it 
that may be scaring them. And it's just an easy reassurance. Look, it's safe, it's flooring. It can sometimes make a huge difference. Same thing with contrast. Um, colors may not always be seen the same, may not be as bright and vibrant as they once were. And so sometimes, oh, yeah. like in bathrooms, we'll see if you walk into a room, it's a white wall, there's a white toilet, there's a white floor. All of a sudden, it's really hard to figure out where things are at. And so we've had caregivers who struggled with their loved one going to the restroom because they found out the loved one can't really decipher where the toilet is compared to the wall and the floor. Same things with the bathtub. You're like, get in the shower, get in the shower, but they can't really navigate the white wall, the white tub, white floor, where they need to go and what they need to do. So sometimes it's as simple as adding some contrast. You can get those rubber, sticky, like non-stick, like fish or things that you can stick on the bathtub floor. You don't have to just do that. You can put them on a wall, um, but help create some contrast in the bathroom can make a big difference. So here are a couple of pictures, um, just with some different examples. So over here, you see the tile with the black holes. So that's kind of an example. If you see that on the floor, we don't think much about it. But if you look at it in one way, it's like there's a lot of holes on the floor. And so that's not a very safe or secure floor to step on. Same thing with the basket view. All of a sudden, if you're on a solid floor and then it looks like you're asking you to step onto a basket, again, not a secure place to step. Reflections in the mirror. All of a sudden, the window reflections are on the floor. So where does the window start? And where does it stop? Um, and that can be a challenge. This kind of shows what I was talking about with the toilet and the bathroom and the contrast, and the veil being able to see things around and the importance of contrast. And then these stairs are kind of the lack of contrast. Um, you know, yeah, uh, it's hard to see where one step starts and one where it ends. And so we don't even think about it. And after I was doing this, even my own steps on my deck, I would realize I was like, they're all kind of the exact same. And a little dark outside dusk, it's hard to tell where one step starts and one stops. So that's just overall good safety, stair safety. Uh, but just, I saw this picture, I was like, exactly. So I told you judgment and decision-making are kind of all wrapped into what we do with our senses. So some things that we see when it comes to like processes and how things work, how they operate, we take a lot of things for granted. Um, the ability to work power tools, to work the microwave, um, the garbage disposal. They're things we just kind of know and do. But if for some reason we forget that a garbage disposal, the switch is over here, because it's not usually right there, and we're doing something and we accidentally turn that switch on, that could be really bad. So a lot of times with garbage disposals, we encourage people to unplug them at a certain point, just because it's not worth the risk, um, because it's just so disconnected from the environment. Microwaves, being mindful of that. A lot of times people can work for a while, they've had it, but if they get a new microwave, it becomes very challenging. Microwaves are challenging in general, but especially new ones. But remember, you can't put foil on a microwave, or you can't put a metal pan on a microwave. Those are all safety factors to be thinking about. Power tools are another big one. Um, I have a lot of gentlemen who love power tools. They use them constantly. Um, my muscle memory, they've done it for years. But it's always important to be mindful that you never know when that one point's gonna come when they can't remember to put the safety on, or they can't remember how to control it. So a lot of times the steps are, use the power tools, but make sure you have somebody in the room with you, have a loved one with you. And sometimes that can be even, I'm gonna teach somebody how to do this, and but there's somebody else there helping observe. And eventually it may be that they have to be locked up. So being mindful of where things are, garage, basement, shed. Um, there are a lot of things that we just don't think about. Lawnmowers, um, you know, important things that we take for granted that we do every day. We need to be thinking about the judgment and the processing and the decision-making. What happens if, what our loved one be able to handle that if, if it happened. Um, we look at finances and scams. Finances isn't always part of home safety, but it's an important thing to think about um, because there are one, there are a lot of scams out there that don't hit just people with dementia, they hit everybody, but the scammers are getting really good. Um, so being mindful, of your loved ones are on the phone, they're talking to people, um, they're buying lots of gift cards, monitoring their bank accounts, make sure that they're not buying hundreds of dollars of gift cards and sending them somewhere. Um, so it's important conversations to have, especially early on, um, to have these conversations about what, what if this happens, putting some safeguards in place, talking to banks, maybe setting limits of how much can be used at certain times, at some point maybe switching over to prepaid cards, so I don't know why I mean saying take away all their money and their access to everything, but trying to set up safeguards to help protect them. Um, 
is important. And another conversation about power of attorney when it comes to financial decisions, the earlier you can have those conversations so that they can have whoever they want to be in charge of their finances long term, get them in play, get them caught up, get them on the bank, talking to the bank ahead of time saves you a lot of headache later when something does change. Another big um, safety issue with medications. Um, it's not only just taking our medications, but it's taking them correctly. So sometimes what we'll see is people are really good at setting up their medications. They may be really good about taking their morning meds, but they may forget those night meds. But depending on what meds you're on, if you forget your blood pressure medicine routinely, that can have major side effects. Or if you take that blood pressure medicine too many times because you forgot you took it and you take it again, it can also have side effects. So it's trying to make sure that your loved one is taking their medication correctly and taking it regularly. Because another big thing we'll see is they're doing great, but then the refills come up and they forgot to tell somebody we need new refills or they forgot to call and get a refill. And then all of a sudden it's been a month and they haven't taken their medication. So a lot of times just having an extra eye to glance to make sure my are are taking correctly is good and kind of just continuing to monitor with your loved one. Um, it makes one of those adaptations we talked about. Maybe it's going from them doing it themselves to a pill planner um, and then with some monitoring and then it's setting alarms. There can be a lot of different stages to this to keep them independent as long as possible because that's always the goal. But knowing that at some point they're going to need some more supervision to make sure they're safe. And then decisions kind of goes around. We talked about that. But one thing that sometimes we think about with showers, um, we take this for granted to walk in and we have to turn on the hot water and the cold water. All of a sudden you get in there, there's some knobs and knobs look different in different showers. How do I do that? So sometimes it's as easy as putting some fingernail polish or a marker that marks one red, one blue. It can be a good, just a signal and adaptation for them to help them know, oh, I turned this on for cold, I turned this on for hot. Um, when you talk about hot water, another safety thing, we'll talk a little bit about in a minute, but is being sure hot water is set to like 120 or less so they don't scald themselves. So just having some precautions in place. When it comes to the computer, some of those decisions, lots of people are online now, but knowing when not to click that link when it pops up, um, knowing when not to respond to that text that just randomly comes in. Again, it's those scammers and it's those decision making things. So um, there's a lot of things to think of and it kind of weaves throughout our everyday life. So sometimes, like I said, it's just taking a step back and kind of thinking through all the simple little processes and how it can be affected and how you can make um, some changes. I have this a quick question yeah. regarding that. Can you recommend a phone where only um, contacts can call in to them? So I don't have a specific phone per se. There's okay. a lot of different things out there. A lot of phones have settings okay. um, that you can switch to only ring when contacts call. Okay. But it varies between providers, um, if you're Apple or Android, or Google. There's, so there's a lot of different variations out there. There are lots of different types of phones out there. Okay. Um, some are much better, much more simpler than others. Okay. So each phone's a little bit different. Okay, thank you. So, um, so this is one of my favorite examples because it's so just a visual thing. In a bathroom, a lot of times you're gonna find toothpaste, you're gonna find some muscle rub or some other chemical medication type thing, um, antibiotic ointment, things like that, all usually kept in the bathroom. They look very similar both tubes, that lids. Um, so it's sometimes hard to know which one you take and stick on your toothbrush and brush your teeth with. Um, so that comes in that judgment, that smell, that taste. When it comes to sensitivity um, of touch, when I was talking about the hot water here, sometimes our ability to sense things, it's decreased. Um, and again, that processing speed. So I may stick my hand in hot water, but not realize it's hot water for a few seconds. But a few seconds of really hot water, a few seconds on a stove can do a lot of damage. Um, so again, checking the hot water heater. At some point, it may come to needing to unplug your stove so that that's not an option to actually turn it on or hurt yourself or, again, set something on it and get something on fire. Um, it's important to lock up sharp items, especially in the kitchen. Um, but not just in the kitchen, again, we're talking about garage, basement, where objects that could cause harm. Um, and then again, simplifying things, making sure the bathroom has just the things you need to do those simple things, brush your teeth, wash your face. Okay. Um, we'll go a little bit more into this, but other things we consider are balance. Um, and that's where it gets really important when we talk about stairs and lights, um, our environment, the flooring, making sure we have clear pathways. Um, internal feelings a lot of times can get disconnected. Um, where I've heard people describe it sometimes as 
They're just going through the motions kind of in a fog, um, but that can lead to a lot of safety issues. So being aware of that. Um, a couple more examples of just things you can do to help with um, deter deterrence. So sometimes it can be as simple as a sign, a warning sign, red, an exclamation point, a stop sign can sometimes be a deterrent. If you don't want them to use the microwave anymore, you may put a stop sign up there and it may help them know not they don't need to use that. They make things like this, they're stickers. They can go on doors. They have some that go on mirrors. They can sometimes be a deterrent, especially if wandering is happening um, to kind of help them not realize where that door is and kind of help disguise. So there's a lot of different resources and tools that are out there for safety. Um, again, it varies person to person on what safety issues you're dealing with, but there are resources out there. Physical abilities, again, this is going back to like fall risk, fall safety, keeping pathways clear, keeping the home lit, making sure the stairs and steps have access, you don't have lots of clutter, things on the stairs, wearing sturdy shoes, non-skid socks. A lot of times, a lot of our flooring is becoming this hard surface, but making sure the water's not on there, there's no drips from the refrigerator or the ice maker. They could lead a spot where you could slip and fall. We want to prevent falls if all possible. Some other examples of some of that adaptive safety equipment we were talking about can be really important and really helpful. So there's grab bars, there's transfer benches for showers. And grab bars can be put in different places. There's raised toilet seats. Um, and this is again goes back to reaching out to an occupational therapist, home safety evaluation, and getting the right placement, um, making sure they're installed correctly so they can be helpful. Um, we talk about sense of time and place. So this can be disorientation, I'm in a room, but why am I in this room? Where is this room? Um, like Dr. Wojewski talked about, you could be with your loved one, you step out for a minute, and all of a sudden they can't remember that you, you know, where you're at. Traveling, sometimes you can see this where I'm at. And sometimes it, people can just get a quick reorientation and get right back to where they need to be but it can be overwhelming at times. And when that happens, sometimes we'll see wandering and getting lost. We also can see this with driving safety. You're driving, but there's construction all of a sudden. And so the environment looks a little bit different and that can be very disorienting and trying to figure out where I am, where I need to go, how do I get home? So driving safety becomes really important as well. Driving is a huge issue that we talk about a lot. Um, so like Dr. Bojaska talked about, there are some cutoffs that we look at with the mental testing. But some things as caregivers or care partners that are important to think about and questions to ask yourself and your loved one. Um, do they have trouble locating familiar places? Can they make it to the grocery store just fine? Um, are they going to the grocery store and it's taking them a little longer? And why is it taking them a little longer? Is it because they've taken three wrong turns to get there consistently um, and it takes them a different route coming home? Um, overall, are they making slower or poorer decisions? Because we know reaction time is really important when it comes to driving as well. You never know when something's going to run out in front of you, um, or a car is going to dart in front of you or stop suddenly. So how is their reaction time? How are they when it comes to something suddenly happening? Do they get easily angered or confused um, outside of driving and then within driving? Sometimes you even notice this as a passenger, all of a sudden they can get road rage sitting next to you. That's why probably they don't need to be behind the wheel. Have there been an increase in fender benders or hitting curbs? Um, sometimes with parking, that depth perception can change. And so those turns, that parking can become very challenging. Um, and have they started to limit their driving? Maybe you've noticed all of a sudden they are saying, hey, why don't you drive today? Or no, I don't want to go out tonight. It's getting dark. I don't want to, you know, traffic's going to be too bad. Making some excuses why they're not driving and self-limiting. That can be another sign that they may not feel as secure about driving. And there are a lot of things. Um, to think about and to monitor and negotiate with your loved one. A lot of times we encourage you to ride with them because if you don't feel comfortable riding with your loved one, that's a really good sign that they don't need to be driving anymore. Um, you can ask doctors. A lot of times our doctors will write a prescription pad and said, unfortunately, you can no longer drive, but that gives the doctor, it's the doctors, the bad person. They put it on there. Why can't I drive? Remember the doctor said you couldn't drive. That way it's taking it off of you. We also, a lot of times we'll talk about driving retirement. Um, so it's not we're taking the driving away from you, you're making the active choice to retire from driving um, for your safety and for other safety. We also sometimes will bring in insurance and the risk 
that are involved. If you continue driving, you've got a diagnosis in your record and something happens, even if it's not your fault. There's a lot of those lawyers out you see on those billboards and if they get wind of anything, they can come and that means they could take away all that we've saved and we've earned um, just because somebody else made a mistake and I have a diagnosis in my record. So different ways to address it. Each person's different on their feelings for driving. It's not always an easy conversation. The Alzheimer's Association has a lot of great resources and tools. Um, UK at Cardinal Hill, their occupational therapist program, they do a driving evaluation program. So you can sign up, your doctor writes a form saying you're okay to try it, and they go out with you and they drive with you for over an hour and evaluate and they come back and they talk about, here are your strengths, here are the areas to work on. And sometimes they'll even work with you on these areas, give you some additional practice and say reevaluate in six months. Or they may say, you're doing okay right now, but you really shouldn't be driving at night. So they'll give you some different um, guidelines to help. And it can be a good intermediate step um, in that driving retirement. We always want safety first. Um, so just good reminders for everybody. Checking your home safety devices, so smoke alarms, carbon monoxide detectors. You wanna keep those, make sure those are regularly checked, batteries are up to date, smoke. Um, fire extinguishers are in place. All of those important things. Have a plan. Kind of think through what would happen, especially depending on your situation, if you have a loved one that lives independently but nearby, what would happen if there was a fire? Who would do what? Have you talked to the neighbors around? Would they be helpful? What would happen if they're in your home and living with you and something happens? Kind of have thought through some of these ideas. Who would come stay if you have to leave and go somewhere else? Um, kind of have, develop a few plans to have in place. Um, along that line, can my loved one stay alone? Um, there does come a time when your loved one shouldn't stay at home alone. Um, so a lot of times what we will ask people is, would they know what to do if there was a fire? If the house caught on fire, the smoke alarm went off. Would they know what that alarm meant? Would they be able to respond to it? Would they be able to go and call 911 and say, my house is on fire? How would they handle if somebody came knocking at the door and said, I'm here to fix your cable? Would they know they did not call somebody to fix their cable? Or would they invite them in and show them where the TV was? Um, so kind of thinking through those scenarios that could very well happen if you're not at home and how would they handle them? Um, and then also being mindful that as care partners, you may need a break. This is a lot to think through, it's a lot to evaluate. And so that's why we talk about the importance of reaching out for help. Um, there's organizations that can help. Uh, there are people, friends that you may have that have offered help. Make sure you take them up on that. Um, Think about things that they can help in different ways if it's helping with finances or picking up prescription drugs or different things like that. Um, start to continue to build your team um, because it's hard to care give by yourself. And so it's important to have that team and reach out for those help as needed. So that was the end. Do y'all have any questions before I hand it over to Regina? I just wanted to give a plug. We were talking about medications. Uh, I'm sure there are other pharmacies, but Wheeler Pharmacy has a home connection program. Yes where they sort out the medication. I know for my sister, she's fairly independent when we realized that her meds were not. Yeah. And we got it. And I mean, just what they were able to come up and help with is giving her back her confidence and giving her back a pen that she yes. doesn't have to refile yeah. anything. But anyway, it's home connection and they have a geriatric pharmacist there and they, they're wonderful. It is an amazing program. And it, like you said, it does keep people independent a lot longer. Um, there are other programs out there. Amazon has pill packs that you can get where it delivers to you and everything is in a little package and it will tell you what time of day to have it. Um, so let's say this is your morning meds, your evening meds. So that's kind of each individual is different on their needs. So some people just need it kind of sorted and put together and can follow that well. Some people at some point are going to get to where they need administration, where they need to see somebody or somebody needs to see them actually take it because even a phone call, hey, have you taken your meds? Oh, yeah, I took my meds. But they may not have, they may have great intentions. They may be in the other room and they're talking to them on the phone. Oh yeah, I'll go do that now. Hang up the phone, they walk into that room. Why was I in this room? And they get distracted, they go somewhere else and they never take those meds. So eventually it is gonna get to a point where somebody's gonna have to watch to make sure they take it correctly. But yes, there are a lot of different resources out there to help with medication as well. Yes, because I just checked. I've got pen cameras in the house. Uh -huh. I mean, obviously not in certain rooms, but like I just checked, mom's working a puzzle right Yeah. So that has been just a peace of mind 
and safety, I guess, too. Yeah, no, technology has definitely come a long way to help with safety. So we didn't even touch about like door alarms, cameras can be really helpful. And a lot of some cameras you can even talk to, so at times, um, doorbell, the ring cameras and stuff where you can help monitor who's coming to the door to help ward off you know, some of those solicitors. Um, so technology has become very helpful at times. It is kind of managing to know how your loved one would respond to if you have those cameras that talk. Are they going to do well with the voice just coming out of nowhere talking? No. Uh, some people are great, right. others are right. terrifying. <laughs> so, but there are a lot of, and it's constantly changing technology. I mean, there are whole fields of working with caregivers and technology to figure out things that they can do to make staying home longer independently possible. So it's um, it's always evolving, but yeah, humors are a great, a great addition for sure. Well, I'm going to switch gears here real quick. Regina from the uh, Area Agency on Aging is going to come, and she's going to talk about a couple of her different programs the Area Agency on Aging provides. Thank you all so much. As Sarah said, I'm Regina Goodman with the Bluegrass Area Agency on Aging and Independent Living. And so um, we're just going to go through this a little bit just to talk about some of the uh, programs that our agency offers. Sometimes I switch gears. Sometimes I'll talk about uh, caring for the caregiver and ways to do that. But I also feel like uh, finding out these resources and programs that uh, can support you as caregivers is also taking care of yourself. So that's why I decided with this audience today that, that we would go with... Um, this program, but then at the end of this, I have some specific new programs that I wanted to uh, talk about. Okay, so the acronyms, you, you've heard how many acronyms today, the MMSE, the BGA, D, D, all of that. So these are just some, we love our acronyms. So the Kentucky uh, Department of Aging and Independent Living is what we call Dale, the Bluegrass Ad, uh, is located at 699 Perimeter Drive. That is where we are housed. Uh, I work for the Bluegrass Area Agency on Aging and Independent Living, which is a mouthful, but sometimes I will just say Bluegrass Ad because it's just a little bit easier to get out. But all that means is we are all housed um, in the building on perimeter, but the Bluegrass Ad has um, uh, aging program, workforce program, community planning, and different things like that. But our specific area, we're located on the first floor, and we uh, administer the um, aging program. And then Aging and Disability Resource Center, that is, uh, we use that acronym a lot. We just say ADRC because that is... Um, the easiest thing to say. So at ADRC, you'll hear me talk about quite a bit because as much as I talk about what programs that we can offer, you have to go through that number. We have a special um, department that that's what they do. They enter those calls, screen for those services, and then they make those appropriate referrals. And so um, you'll hear me talk about that quite a bit. And then the Older Americans Act, that's where a lot of our funding comes from. Our National Family Caregiver Support uh, Program is funded through the Older Americans Act. So you may hear me talk about that as well. And so this talks just a little bit more in detail about what the Area Agency on Aging is. Um, and so every community has one, and you can... Uh, Find that by going to uh, uh, www.eldercare.gov. Now, um, within our state, we have 15. So if you hear me talking about services, we serve 17 counties, but say you your family member is in Moorhead and they need services too. There are also, there's also um, an area agency in that serves that area, and that's the gateway ad. So there's 15 different ads that so that we cover the entire state. So if you all are from a different area today and you need help um, locating the, the agency that is where your loved one is, then just let me know. And it's in your folders as well. Yeah, yeah, well, right. the whole state. yeah. And then the, the um, Sarah talked about the Pathways Guide, that's the orange uh, booklet here. We that's a uh, an annual. We put that out annually. This is the newest one, and like she said, it's basically 
like a phone book for elder uh, services and that we cover 17 counties. And I believe that we are on page 10. So if you forget, you know, what, when I talk about the ADRC and those numbers, I think that, that we are on page 10 of that guide. But what we are, we do not do direct services. We are more of a uh, referral agency. And so we promote and provide for the development of community-based systems of care, which include planning, access and delivery of services, coordination of activities and program and advocacy on behalf and education for older persons, disabled individuals and caregivers in the community. And about once a year, we will have an ad advocacy day in uh, Frankfurt. So here are our counties, Anderson, Bourbon, Boyle, Clark, Estill, Fayette, Franklin, Garrett, Harrison, Jessamine, Lincoln, Madison, Mercer, Powell, um, Nicholas, Scott, and Woodford County. And somebody asked me what counties we served the other day. And from my memory, I got all but Estill. I had forgotten Estill County. But um, so like I said, this is our area, but if you're not in that area, we can we can find help for you. And so these are just some of our services and programs, the ADRC, uh, uh, the senior centers, nutrition programs, home care, uh, the nursing home ombudsman agency, legal services, SHIP, um, health promotions and disease pre prevention programs, the National Family Caregiver Support Program, which I will talk about more in detail in a few minutes, uh, Medicaid waiver, uh, we administer the participant directed services portion of that, the mental, Bluegrass Mental Health and Aging Coalition and Elder Abuse Prevention. So those are some of the things that we um, that we administer through there. Like I said, we don't do hands-on direct services. Sometimes people will call and say, hey, can you come out and give my mom a bath? No, we, we don't do that, but we can provide you the information and the agencies. We may administer the program that does that, but we do not provide those hands-on direct service. Um, and so this is just more of what we talked about with the ADRC um, and, and that starting point. Um, so some of the things that we do through the... Um, at the senior centers, the elder nutrition program, the congregate meals are served at senior centers. You have to be 60 years of age or older, um, a spouse of an individual or the spouse of an individual 60 year older, have a disability or live at home with an eligible older individual. Donations are requested, but no one is turned away. And I don't, we have a senior center in every county as well. And I don't know if you have visited any of those senior centers, but the one in Fayette County is amazing they're they're all nice and they're all different than probably what you remember maybe your grandmother going to and that kind of thing but um they're all nice and i would give them I'll give them a chance if you haven't visited one and then this is just more about our home delivered meals program um like i said a lot of our funding is through the older americans act and in 1965 laid the foundation for what has become uh, the Senior Centers and Aging Services Network, including the area agencies on aging. In 1973, amendments to the OAA created grant funding that was made available to community agencies to create, create the area agencies on aging. Okay. This is just more about the, the senior centers. Um, so this is our National Family Caregiver Support Program. And um, I noticed when it came up that it said uh, 2023. It has been updated <laughs> since then. So this number is not um, accurate. I will need to fix that on this slide. So our National Family Caregiver Support Program, I think I gave everyone um, a brochure. If you didn't get one, I don't know if I put it back there, but I do have more of those. So it is funded through the Older Americans Act to provide a respite for the caregiver. Like I said, it's not a direct, a lot of programs are direct services for our loved one, but this is to support the caregiver. So we actually, that should be $2,100 oh, wow. per fiscal year for That's respite. Great. Yes. And so our fiscal year runs from July 1st through June 30th. So we just, our funding year just started over again in July. So there's plenty of time to access this funding. And then the supplemental, um, well, let me explain a little bit more about the respite care since I have you here. So um, there's two ways that you can utilize the, the respite. So first of all, you would call your ADRC, you would be screened, they would give me your referral, then you would get an application. 
And so sometimes people get confused when they get that application so quickly because they have probably talked about Medicaid waiver and other programs. So they get this application. I don't really know what it is, but it is, uh, it's a respite care program funded through the Older Americans Act. And so you can utilize that through either the agency that we contract with, which is currently Independent Assistance of the Bluegrass. If you choose them, then you schedule with them. They send their care assistant out to the home to stay with your loved one while you go to your own doctor's appointments, attend things like this, go to lunch with the friend. So it is to give you those very important breaks is what that funding is for. Um, if the agency is not an option for you and you would rather have someone you know uh, provide that respite, then that's an option as well. So you can choose reimbursement where you have a friend or family member come in and where the agencies charge $30 an hour to provide that risk, but maybe your friend would do it for 10 or 15. So it might stretch that 2100 out um, a little bit more. And so that's that's what that is. It's for someone to, to stay with your loved one to ensure their safety while you are getting those breaks. And then in addition, under the National Family Caregiver Support, um, do you want me to think? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. okay. Get your stuff. <laughs> Pick it up. Um, and so we also have uh, supplemental supplies, and that should also that should be changed to five hundred dollars. And so it's five hundred dollars this fiscal year uh, for supplemental supplies, like incontinent supplies, which covers diapers, wipes, chucks, gloves. I know sometimes insurance. Thank you for coming. Um, sometimes insurances will provide for the for the adult diapers, but yeah, not you're, you're welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you yeah. for coming. Yeah. Um, and so um, they'll provide for the diapers, but not those products that go along with that, the the wipes and the gloves and the the chucks for the bed and those kind of things. Um, and then it, even some small medical equipment, like a shower bench and things like that would be covered under that supplemental. Um, the eligibility for this program, the Older Americans Act programs are not income-based. Sometimes people worry about, oh, I, I make too much money, I won't be able to qualify for that. Older Americans Act programs are not income-based. You just have to be caring for someone 60 years of age or older or younger than 60 with a dementia diagnosis. Nobody's going to ask for your bank records, exactly. your house, and any of that. Besides the 12-page application that looks very overwhelming, <laughs> it's just a lot of repetitive information. I think we asked for your name and address like three times. <laughs> so it looks very overwhelming, but once you get into it, and if it is overwhelming, you just call me. And I have many a times just gone step by step through the application. We work through it together. If I had more time, I would love to do home visits, but sometimes that's not always feasible, but I could, I can go step by step through those questions and answer any of those. And so we've talked about the eligibility now, also <laughs> under the National Family Caregiver Support Program. So we help the caregivers who are caring for, um, you know, the elderly parents and, and uh, that, but we also have another group of caregivers who are grandparents and relatives who are raising their grandchildren. And so we have a portion of our program that we can use for that. They do have to be 55 years of age. They're not, it's not income based, but they do have to be 55 years of age or older. Um, and in this program, it can help them. And actually it helps them until their 19th birthday. So through that 18th year. So they have to be caring for their grandchild, they have to be living with them, the biological parents cannot be living with them, but we help them purchase um, clothing, personal hygiene, school supplies. We take um, <coughs> we schedule shopping trips to Walmart and we go a uh, couple times a month usually, and then uh, online is an option as well. So if you or anyone you know is a grandparent or relative raising their grandchildren, we can also help with that. So the Medicaid waiver and participant directed services, we receive the ADRC receives a lot of calls for this. This is a much uh, lengthier and involved process than what mine is. So mine, you fill out your application, you send it in with the Medicaid waiver, which is how uh, people can continue to receive their uh, services in their home instead of in a nursing home or facility. Uh, but you know there are lots of qualifications and requirements for that. But our ADRC will walk you step-by-step step through those. 
And then this is more uh, information about the Medicaid waiver. And then the SHIP program, um, this program will help with, uh, with Medicare, uh, with your options, with uh, open enrollment I think is in October. And so they are always really good about asking those questions because I know that that can, can kind of be confusing, especially with all the commercials and everything, all the different types of uh, Medicare programs. But if you ever have any questions, they can help you. All of these, all anything that I'm talking about is gonna be in that pathways guide too. Uh, and then Legal Aid of the Bluegrass can offer free uh, legal advice uh, for Kentucky and 60 years or older, um, not in criminal law matters, uh, but they can help you if you have like um, estate planning questions and things like that, they can help you with that. Okay, and then uh, how to report elder abuse. This is the um, hotline for that. And then these are some of our uh, evidence-based programs that are, these are usually conducted at the senior center. So funding funnels through us, but they are actually a lot of these programs at your local senior centers. Um, one of the most popular ones is Drums A Lot. That seems to be a very uh, popular class for seniors to take at the senior centers. Um, and then the Bluegrass Mental Health and Aging Coalition, um, I am not on, on that coalition, but we have um, uh, other staff that are involved in that as well. And we um, they conduct the Empowering Mindfulness uh, Conference every year in Clark County as, as a part of this coalition. And then the Home Care Program is a state-funded uh, program, and it is a program where you can this is direct services for your loved one. So where they could receive their homemaking and um, personal care services in their home. That's not waiver. This is a different program. How do you get in touch with them? So all of these programs that I'm talking about, um, you have to contact your RADRC. If you'll hand me that book, I believe that we are... On page 10, it varies sometimes what page, sometimes we're on the front cover. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that book. Let me see, is it 10? Yes. So we are on page 10. So any of the programs that I've talked about or you saw on the screen that you are interested in uh, being screened for, you call this um, ADRC number, 866-665-7921. Now, because it is our starting point and we serve 17 counties, um, once you call that number, you're probably going to have to leave your contact information and someone will call you back, but it may take a, even a week or two. But once they call you back, then they'll screen you for those services. Now, what I'll advise people to do is once you've left that contact information, answer your phone, even if it comes up a number you don't recognize. We've been told our number comes up spam risk. But even if you do miss the call, make sure your voicemail is cleared out and you can accept uh, messages because they will leave a detailed message about who they are and who you can uh, contact. The, the, um, the screen before that one. Um, the screen before that one. Before that. But, okay. what, what's the name of that program? Just home care. Just home care service. Mm -hmm. so that is an asset-based service. Is that correct? So that one is the state funded. I think that they, um, so you must be screened. If, if, you, if you are eligible for the home and community-based waiver, then you can apply for that. But this, you can apply for home care if you are not eligible for the waiver services. But you would still call um, the ADRC and they will work, walk you through all of those steps. Okay. So I just wanted to go through that. I know I went through that quickly and that was a lot of information, but um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about that um, is new to us and to uh, the state in general is a couple of years ago, the state realized, you know, we saw the Department of Aging and Independent Living, our, Dale, our, that's our state um, entity. They realized the importance of um, care, people who are caring for people with dementia, they have realized the importance 
of that and what they're doing, and they developed the Office of Dementia Services. So it is a, it is its own office. It's ran by Jennifer Craig, and in doing so, we have uh, gotten some very beneficial programs out of that. And what that office is doing is it wants to be another layer of support for our caregivers and people living with dementia. And one of those, I think everybody got this flyer in there. I think I laid it on, on your um, folders. And if you did not receive one, there's one back there too. So um, the Dementia Tier mm -hmm. Services, so as another role of program coordinator is uh, the title of dementia care specialist. And so that is that is me as well, but you can, uh, that number on there is my direct number. So you can call me uh, directly and at, um, ask me questions. But what they've done is they're, they've applied for grants that help um, caregivers. One of those grants is called Bridging the Gap. And so when you call ADRC and get your application for, uh, the National Family Caregiver, we can use that application to extend your services. And what that is, is it's kind of a continuation of um, the caregiver program, but through that, it also offers like monthly <coughs> classes for the caregivers. And one of those is a class called Dealing with Dementia, and that was established through the Rosalind Carter Institute. And so I have been, um, trained in that and I had my first class in July at our in our office and so what that is is uh, we, we are going to have those periodically our next one is going to be in Clark County we are trying to um, also reach out to our rural counties through the Office of Dementia Services and not just have everything located in Lexington we want to go out and have those those programs for our rural counties so we will be having our dealing with dementia class in um, Clark County, we will be promoting that on our Facebook page. So if you do Facebook, if you want to follow the Bluegrass Area Agency on Aging and Independent Living, that's where we uh, that's where we post a lot of our services. And so that, uh, if you attend that class, it comes with a, they have developed this wonderful book that helps you with um, guiding yourself through this caregiving um journey with your loved one and so it's very detailed so that training class shows you step by step how to use that book so that we don't just shove a book at you that's this thick and say hey this is going to help you take it so it actually helps you uh, we work through the book together showing you how to use it and, and what is in it and so those classes like I said the next one's in uh, Clark County in September but we hope to make those um, a recurring thing and also um, we're hoping to I'm hoping to pair with Sarah and Meredith to do some of uh, the memory cafes out in the rural counties as well so those are some of the services that we are trying to um but to initiate. Is that Rosalind Carter class just a one-time class or is that multiple classes? So just for that training, you just have to attend it one time because you're going to book. get that book okay. and then you can, of course, call me if you have any questions. But um, it, I, I think it's it's one of my favorite things uh, so far to do. I was real nervous to do it at first, but, um, I, but I like it and I think the caregivers really um, enjoyed it. And so that is... Um, so the dementia care specialist is another uh, role and just another um, layer of support that I wanted to, you know, were the perfect audience for me today to share that information with. And then also back on the table, and I may have given you some as well, um, Lexington has been really um, uh, proactive in caring for uh caregivers with dementia. And so they developed the Dementia Friendly Lexington. And this card, there's a QR code. And if you go on there, it will give you more information about that. And that is training um, like restaurants and churches and realtors and different people in the community about the disease so that maybe they can respond uh, differently to people. And then on the back of that card, it says, Please be patient. The person with me has dementia slash Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for understanding. 
So I've got some of these cards back there too. If you want to keep these in your wallet, maybe you're in a social situation and your loved one may be saying or doing things, or maybe at a restaurant, and you can just slip this to the server. And you know, that will hopefully prompt them to be a little bit more patient uh, and, and handle things just a little bit more differently than maybe they would. And then back there on that table as well, I have just some um. The journals, that's, that's, I don't have any more of those journals, but that is a good tool to, you can write down all the, all the medications and doctor's appointments and things like that. Thank you, man. Um, so I have those back there. And then I also have, um, it's not like the Life Alert where you have the monthly payment, but it is a device that may be helpful. And I do have more of those. I only have three or four back there on the table that you all are welcome to. And I have a whole box if you are interested in just taking that with you. It's for fall prevention. Um, if you would just like to uh, take that with you and try that. So um, I know I've just given you tons of information. Does anybody have any questions? On the uh, device you were just talking about, do you have to be within a certain radius of your home? I, I think you do. Um, we purchased those uh, for National Family Caregiver Month in November, and we sent those out. It's just a, it's an item that we found on Amazon that we thought might be helpful, but I do think that it, you, there is a distance on that that it works. And it is battery operated, like I said. It does, it's hard to find those types of devices that you don't have to pay the monthly fees for. But we thought that maybe that would be beneficial, uh, especially you know for home use. So. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I just wanted to make sure that you all heard some of this information and heard some of these terms and services. And my card is back there as well. I mean, it's also on these flyers. Um, if you have any, you know, general questions, I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, and then, like I said, to actually um, enroll in any of the programs, you would need to call that number on page 10. So thank you very much for your time. All right, we're going to do a quick five-minute break, and then we'll come back for our last presenter. <laughs> Okay. All right. We're going to go ahead and get started with our last session today. Um, I'm Meredith with the Alzheimer's Association. I'm pleased to introduce Laura Day, one of our community educator volunteers. So um, one thing that we do at the Alzheimer's Association is go out into the community to give presentations like what we're going to do today, healthy living for your brain and body. Um, so if you know of a church or another organization that you think would benefit from this kind of information, um, I've got my cards in the back and we're always happy happy to schedule these. They're free. We just want to get the word out. So um, without further ado, Laura, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. I have a little bit of allergies today, so I'm hoping my voice does not go on me. Uh, but I'm here to do talk today about healthy living for the brain and body. And uh, this is for you all. I guess everybody in here is a caregiver or about to be a caregiver. And so these are some tips um, about taking uh, good care of yourself, um, both your body and your brain, and uh, looking at some uh, ways that you could perhaps stave off uh, cognitive decline or dementia uh, as you age. Uh, I always say that this course would be best, or this presentation would be best given uh, to high schoolers or college students, you know, before they, they get those bad habits um, set in. But the good news is it's never too late to start. And um, Regina had given you a, a tremendous amount of, of good information about respite and, and respite's part of taking care of yourself. So um, what I'm going to say today is it's, it's a lot of common sense and nothing that you we'll see here or hear here today uh, is something that your mother had, didn't tell you when you were growing up, right? Or something you haven't read in a magazine. However, what I'm going to talk about today is actually science-based. So these are, these is, this is evidence-based recommendations for taking care of your body and brain. So maybe that gives it a little bit more credibility than just having your mom say, don't do this or do that. So let's go ahead and get started. 
So the learning objectives today are to identify certain behaviors and how they affect our brains and body and list some strategies for healthy decision making in the following areas. And so again, common sense, sleep, smoking, meaning not smoking, uh, mental health, physical activity, balanced nutrition, cognitive engagement, and social engagement. So we're gonna take each one of those in turn. Everybody in here knows this. You probably know a lot more than I do about Alzheimer's and dementia. If you're caring for somebody with the disease, um, the brain is the control center of the body. Uh, we have 100 billion nerve cells, they're called neurons, that create a branching network. And um, signals travel through and pass from neuron to neuron, and that's how we form thoughts, memories, and behaviors. And Alzheimer's disease destroys those brain cells and creates sort of pockets of, of emptiness, if you will, in the brain. And that's what, why it affects memories, thoughts, and behaviors. So obviously, uh, whatever we do in our body is, is our, our brain is the control center. Um, but we also know that the heart and the brain are very interrelated. So 25, 20 to 25% of each of, of the blood that comes from each heartbeat goes to the brain. So the, the, the brain needs good blood flow. So there is, um, you know, the, the, the obvious answer is keep taking good care of your heart will take good care of your brain. So what we like to say is what's good for the heart is good for the brain and vice versa. So again, common sense, we're going to be talking about behaviors and lifestyle choices that impact the heart and make your heart healthy. Here's a quiz. Alzheimer's is a normal part of aging. True or false? False. False. Um, Alzheimer's is progressive and unfortunately a fatal brain disease. Um, symptoms develop slowly, get worse over time, and it, it is not a normal part of aging. So dementia, if you think of it, usually there's an umbrella here. They, they use the umbrella um, icon. <laughs> but if you think about dementia as an umbrella, um, dement, uh, dementia is a general term for um, diseases that cause problems with thinking and memory, enough to disrupt daily life. Okay, we're not talking about an occasional senior moment here. These are things that disrupt normal, normal uh, life. Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. So if you think about the umbrella as dementia, there's a whole bunch of things under that umbrella that can cause dementia right. symptoms. Alzheimer's, and, and it depends on what you read, um, 60 to 80% of dementias are Alzheimer's. But there are many, many, many different types of dementias. So we know that uh, your overall health is affected by your genes and family history. Uh, some genes are called deterministic genes, and that means that you will get the disease uh, if you have that gene. Um, other, others are, are not their genes. They may just increase your risk. Most people do not have the gene that actually determines whether they will get Alzheimer's or not. But there are some people who have a family history where the, the risk might be a bit, uh, a bit higher. Environment, you can't really do anything about your genes, obviously, right? So then you have your environment. Um, Sometimes you can do things about your environment, you can move and so on, but not everybody can. And you think about children being raised in areas where there's lots of pollution, for example, uh, that can impact your health uh, as you get older. Uh, but the one thing that we can do something about is our lifestyle. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So really important to get a baseline of where you are with your blood pressure, your blood sugar, your weight and BMI, which is body mass index, and your cholesterol. We'll look at these here in just a sec. 
So again, we're always going to go back to science on this. So what the science tells us, factors that increase the risk of heart disease and stroke may also increase the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. So again, what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So we have hypertension. Hypertension can lead to heart attacks, stroke. Um, so if your blood pressure is elevated, it's really important to treat it. Untreated uh, high blood pressure, again, heart problems, but also it can lead to uh, cognitive decline. Diabetes. Uh, diabetes is not a cause of dementia. There has not been a causal link determined, but diabetes, uh, people with diabetes um, uh, have an elevated risk for uh, cognitive impairment. So it's very important that if you have diabetes or prediabetes uh, to, to treat that and to take it very seriously. There's also evidence that people who are obese in midlife have an increased risk of cognitive decline as well. Um, Good cholesterol versus bad. We want the good cholesterol, obviously. Uh, bad cholesterol can clog our, our veins, our arteries, and um, you know, create you know, heart issues, um, strokes, and so on. So we want to uh, you know, increase our good cholesterol and keep our heart healthy and thus our brain healthy. Here's another quiz. It's never too late or, or too early or too late to incorporate healthy habits. True. 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 That's right. So as I said at the beginning, it'd be great if, if you all were 20 years old in here. <laughs> but the reality is you're not. <laughs> and neither am I. <laughs> but uh, it is never too late. It's never too late to uh, pick up the pace, start walking, start eating well, quit smoking. Um, and that that is just, um, just you know, just never... It, you never want to just say, I give up. I, I'm just the way I am, okay? Because if you if you want to live a long, healthy life, um, start incorporating those healthy habits as soon as you can. All right. All right, so tips. Get quality sleep. Be smoke-free. Take care of your mental health. Get moving. Eat healthy. Challenge yourself and stay connected. Anybody not hear this before? <laughs> all right, okay, so common sense, all right? But let's, uh, let's hear what the science says. All right, so sleep is essential for overall health and well-being. And what the science tells us is that sleep impacts our overall health. Uh, really important here helps us maintain healthy blood pressure and blood sugar. So remember that high blood pressure can increase your risk for dementia. Uh -huh. So if it's untreated, uh, inadequate sleep can cause problems with memory and thinking. Um, we know how we feel when we don't have enough sleep. Um, try doing that over a lifetime. Um, also, um, and I, I don't want to get too scientific here, but my understanding is when you have good night's sleep, it clears out the junk in your brain, maybe the plaques. So if your sleep is interrupted, your body, your brain doesn't have the time to clear out the plaque, the, the, the junk, if you will, in your brain. So getting a good night's sleep is really important. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to kind of skip these questions. I don't have a lot of time. But I'm going to go right to the tips. So um, if you have trouble sleeping, you know, think about your, your bedroom. Make sure that your room temperature uh, is, is, you know, good for you. Uh, sometimes you can heat your bed up or cool your bed down if you have a fancy bed. Um, make sure the amount of light is, is what you prefer. Um, if you have a partner you're with and you have different ideas about what a good night's sleep is. You could consider being in a different room, uh, but really important to um, get good, a good night's sleep. Turn off those screens. You've all heard that before. Um, sleep uh, Screens can uh, create uh, some sleep disruption. And if you use your phone as your alarm, put it out of arm's length, because if you wake up in the middle of the night, what, what do you want to do? You reach for that phone and, and check your messages, right? So put it out of um, arm's length and get a good night's sleep. And talk to your doctor if you 
are really having trouble falling asleep and especially staying asleep. Um, there can be there are some medications and some other techniques that that uh, he or she can recommend. Be smoke free. I think we all know this. Um, smoking has a direct impact on, on the health of your brain as well as the rest of your body. What the science tells us. Uh, smoking increases the risk of cognitive decline and may increase the risk of dementia. Um, quitting smoking may reduce a person's chance of developing cognitive decline back down to the level of non-smokers. So again, smoking is very detrimental to the heart. Um, it restricts you know, your, your airway, it restricts blood flow to the brain. So um, it, it, stopping smoking uh, can be just a, a game changer and not just for your brain health, but for your heart, for your organs, for your lungs. Um, pretty much every part of your body can be impacted by smoking. These are some questions you could ask yourself. But um, if, if you do um, smoke, you can find support through quit lines. Um, health departments often have smoking uh, cessation classes, um, talk with your doctor or another healthcare provider if you need you know, patches or some other um, type of device to help you uh, quit. Take care of your mental health. Um, make time for self-care. It's really hard to do when you are a caregiver. Um, Regina offered some really valuable suggestions and some, I guess, respite. Um, respite opportunities for people, please avail yourself of, of that, uh, those respite opportunities and make time for yourself. So we know that when people have very, very high stress levels and untreated symptoms of anxiety and depression um, can affect the health of the brain. And so if you have, um, if you include healthy habits, uh, you're more likely to um, also have good mental health. And we'll talk about exercise in particular in just a minute. Skip over this. Go to the next one. There we go. All right. So some tips for self-care. You know, <laughs> take a nap. <laughs> um, go for a walk, dance, uh, sing a song, make a treat, read a book, and watch a funny video. Um, anybody here have? Some tips for self-care. Get a massage. Exercise. Exercise. Okay. We bird watch. Bird watch. All right. Very wildlife. good. What's that? Wildlife. Okay. Wildlife. Uh -huh. Garden. Golfing. Gardening. Gardening. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Very good. So if... If you had to choose anything in that list about, you know, smoking and, you know, nutrition and all that, this is the big one, okay? This is where you put a star. <laughs> so get moving. Um, physical activity can improve brain health. Um, and I was told by a neurologist one year, he said, exercise is the magic elixir. And what that means is, you know, it's just the magic, the magic potion. It's not easy necessarily. It's not like a pill you can take, but it is um, the, the the number one thing that really can um, reduce our risk for dementias. It's not the only thing, but it, it does help. So what the science tells us, consistent cardiovascular activity will, not may, will, reduce the risk of cognitive decline. Why is that? Good heart, good strong heart, good lungs, good brain, okay? Um, physical activity may directly benefit brain cells and reduce other risk factors. And for most people, any increase in movement can have an impact on overall health, okay? So physical activity not only, uh, you know, talk about reducing risk factors, what other, what other conditions can exercise help with? Reducing weight. Reducing your weight. Blood pressure. Depression. Blood pressure. Depression. Depression. Lung capacity. Um, what else? Blood pressure. We said blood pressure. 
strength. Anxiety strength. Uh huh. Very good. Yeah. So we talk about heart healthy, brain healthy. If we are exercising, we may be reducing our risk for diabetes. We may be lowering our blood pressure, which all contributes to uh, brain health. So it's kind of like a, a, you know, not just in and of itself, but it impacts your whole body. But sometimes getting moving is hard, especially if you're not used to doing it. Um, so what one thing that, or some tips that we recommend is starting small. You know, don't don't decide you're going to start, you know, training for a marathon but, and you go on, I'm going to run a mile today. If, if you haven't run a mile in a long time, you know, start by walking a mile or start by walking half a mile or a quarter of a mile or taking the stairs uh, when you usually take the elevator. Um, find things that you can incorporate into your day, like taking the stairs. So what I do is because I have to get my 10,000 steps every day. That's like my, my goal. I don't always get it, but I try. Um, I will try to park as far away from the door from the grocery store as I can. So I can get about 400 steps walking into the grocery store, for example, okay? So I don't look for a parking spot right next to the door. I look for one far away. And just a, a way to kind of start small. And you don't have to go all the way to the back of the parking lot. You can start maybe halfway. <laughs> so. Uh, and then try something fun. Um, I uh, I have a friend. Um, she's my my walking buddy um, and, a, and a colleague. We walk every Sunday, um, and we walk about an hour, a little hour and fifteen minutes, and we can get you know seven thousand steps or so. You know we walk pretty fast, and we're used to it, so we've built up. But um, you know find a friend. It's it's a lot more fun um, than than walking by yourself. It it seems to go by much more quickly. Does anybody else do anything? Exercise wise, that's fun. Mm -hmm. Oh, you golf? Tennis. Okay. Do you, do you walk when you golf? Yes. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tennis. All right. Pickleball, okay. anybody? Farming. Farming. Okay. That, that's exercise. Okay. Very good. All right. Eating healthy uh, may reduce your risk of many diseases. Um, it says may here. Um, diet is. Uh, there is, you know, obviously keeping your heart healthy with a good diet will affect your brain. Uh, it doesn't say will, though, but it may reduce. So what does the science say? Um, what's good for your heart? Good for your brain. Nutritious food is fuel for your brain. So, you know, not eating a lot of uh, sugar and that kind of stuff. Eating a balanced diet may reduce your risk of heart disease, cancer, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, and diabetes. And certainly keeping your weight under control will, you know, help you uh, maintain a healthy heart and thus a healthy brain. So a couple of uh, dietary approaches. Uh, the first one's called DASH, um, Dietary approach Approaches to Stop Hypertension. And this is a low sodium based diet. Um, you can Google it. You can find out what, what some of the foods are, but it really is more limiting of sodium, which of course leads to um, um, high blood or can contribute to high blood pressure. And then the Mediterranean diet. I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of the Mediterranean diet. There's lots and lots of cookbooks out there. Uh, but what these diets focus on are lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, nuts, beans, and whole grains, um, lean meats, fish, and poultry, healthier fats like olive oil, and limited sugar and salt. So, you know, getting a salad in, without a lot of dressing instead of a hamburger, for example. But I think we all know that. I'll go through the questions. All right. Uh, so use olive oil. I mentioned that. Sodium-free spices. Um, focus on what you can add in rather than take away. So what can I do to add some fruit or vegetables? So if you have a bowl of cereal, put some fruit in it. If you make a um, you know pasta sauce, of some kind, maybe put some zucchini in it or something, some kind of vegetable. Um, and build meals around vegetables, beans, and whole grains versus a big piece of meat um, and choose leaner cuts of meat. So chicken, fish, um, lean cuts of beef if you gotta have your beef fixed. You can rice, cauliflower, 
and don't even taste it in spaghetti. Yep, that's or, right. You're right. Or soups. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you for that. Very good. We also want to include a note about vitamins and supplements. Um, there are lots of, of uh, ads on TV and other places uh, about supplements that will help your brain, help your brain. These have not been proven. They are not, um, they are not uh, approved by the FDA. So be very, very careful. They're not recommended. And you would always want to check with your doctor before you take any kind of vitamin or supplement to make sure that it's it's okay. I know there just recently I saw a list of supplements that are causing um, liver damage in people. So um, really want to be careful about going to a, like a GNC or even Kroger and, and pulling those off the shelf without knowing what's in them and what they do. So check with your doctor on that and um, and don't just buy that kind of stuff willy nilly. Um, even if you even if you want to believe the promises that they say, there's really no evidence that they will help you with, with brain health. The other thing, too, about the supplements is that they can impact um, uh, the med other medications that you might be taking. So you want to be very, very careful. Challenging your brain may help lower your risk of cognitive decline. True. True. All right. Yes, definitely. All right, so challenging our mind as we age can lower our risk of dementia. So what is cognitive engagement? Uh, it is a term that means keeping our minds active and challenged. This can be learning new skills, working on a challenging task, or engaging in ongoing learning, okay? so. The key words here are new, challenging, and ongoing, okay? So if you have been a person who loves Sudoku, for example, and you're always just at the beginner level, <laughs> that's what you like because you, you're always good at it. <laughs> challenge yourself. That's great that you do it. Challenge yourself and try the medium or the difficult level, okay? So what we're talking about here is learning something new, challenging yourself. If you like to read, great. Read something that is, a ch is challenging. Read some, a nonfiction book. If you love fiction, read something that, that maybe will challenge your brain more. Um, if you watch mindless TV, maybe watch a documentary and, and learn something. So, you know, again, we want to challenge ourselves. Learn a new skill. Um, maybe try a, new, try a new recipe that's difficult or something that you haven't, haven't done before. Learn to play chess or some other game that is a game of strategy and skill. So as much as we can uh, challenge our brains, the better. And I probably just already said all this. Okay. No, I didn't. Um, keeping your mind active uh, forms new connections. Remember those, those neurons that we have that are firing and, and, you know, just that's what's helping form our thoughts and um, our brain activity. Um, keeping your mind active. It doesn't matter how old you are you're still gonna be forming those, those um, connections among brain cells. It doesn't stop at age 35, it, it keeps on going. So keep on challenging yourself. One thing I'd like to mention here, um, engaging in formal education. We do know one of the risk factors for uh, dementia is fewer years of formal schooling. So if you um, wanna take a class, there's classes available at UK that you can audit if you're over <clears throat> 55, I think. We have the, we we have have the fall brochure right there. Oh, excellent. For Perfect. For Ollie? Okay, great. Uh, so pick one up. And, and, you know, you can attend a class. You don't have to stress about taking tests and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, learn something new um, and be engaged with a, a teacher participant, teacher student kind of relationships. Good for your brain. So there's, there are the tips. Um, learning a new language is also really good. And this is our last one, and it is staying connected. Uh, connecting with others socially uh, can have many health benefits. So what the science tells us that staying socially active may support brain health, 
Um, social engagement is associated with living longer with fewer disabilities. And those who feel well connected with others tend to make healthier choices in other areas. So um, you may have read this before, but they say that if you are if you are lonely, um, it is a, as risky as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, so if you feel lonely um, or isolated, it's really important for your brain health and your your physical health. Um, to find some outlet to to go somewhere to visit people to be with people. There we go. All right. So um, you know one of the one of the great things that folks can do, um, especially if you're retired, uh, is to volunteer. Uh, find a cause that's important for you. Call them up and say. Hey, you know, how can I be of help? Um, I'm a volunteer with the Alzheimer's Association. So, you know, that's a way that I can stay active and, um, you know, keep my brain brain uh, going and, and meet people too. Um, schedule regular phone calls or video chats to keep in touch. So again, uh, maybe, maybe you can't get out in the community that much, but, you know, staying connected to people, hearing people's voices, seeing their faces on, on the screen is, is good. Um, visit friends and family and participate in events in your community. Uh, so, you know, look, look around and, and see what might be available. Um, call up a friend, um, ask if they would like to join you, but just stay connected. So these are the different areas that we just went through. Anybody surprised by anything? Nope. Okay. Oh, well. <laughs> Except it's all science based, so that's the good news. That it really, it really is uh, true, and not not just something that that you were told um, to behave yourself when you were a kid, right? So <laughs> this is all true. Um, Meredith mentioned the the Alzheimer's Association is, is uh, willing to uh, have, send volunteers out to do presentations at your churches or organizations, um, but also if you need help with uh, uh, caregiving questions, um, just questions related to Alzheimer's or dementia in general. Uh, there is a 24-7 helpline. You can see the phone number there. <clears throat> it is staffed as, uh, by people who are master's level um, counselors. And, and so these are people who uh, can really give you the help uh, that you need um, over the phone. Um, there are online resources, lots of information about treatments for Alzheimer's and other um, research and, and tips on caregiving that you can find at alz.org. And then um, there are uh, community resources and you can go to communityresourcefinder.org. Um, we do have the local chapter here in Lexington is on Palumbo Drive um, and Manowar, just outside Manowar. So um, we do have a, a, a physical presence here in Lexington. Any questions? We all heard, heard this before, so I guess no questions. Huh? <laughs> well, it was really nice to uh, present to you today, and uh, hope you had a good morning. Thank you. It's always good to hear it again. Yes, that's very reminded. reminded. It's always good. And you'll take a long way to your car. <laughs> <laughs> And it's far, far away. <laughs> so that is the end of our program today. So I just want to thank all of you for coming and participating. Um, if you have questions, we'll be around. Um, I will be emailing again all of the PowerPoint slides. Um, I, we are recording this today. And so once I get it up online, I will email out where you can find it. If you want to share it with others, um, it will take a few days. So don't expect it quickly. But... Once I get it up and posted and everything, I will make sure I send that link out as well. So thank you all uh, for hosting this. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.